Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Thursday. It's time for coffee. It's August 10th. I can't believe it's August 10th, but we're we're having a coffee chat charcuterie board, a brunch buffet of cases today. It is a catch-up stream. I have been, and you have been, needing a catch-up stream. Um, a lot of the cases are our less heavy cases. I have my coffee in a koozie this morning. That's where I'm at. Storms kept me up last night. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the coffee is in a koozie. This was sent by Lawner to the P.O. Box. It's freaking brilliant. I love it. I know it can also fit in the Stanley. This fits it like it's made for it. It's absolutely uh, amazing and bananas. Here's what we're talking about today. I might get sidetracked, but here's what I'm intending to talk about today. There is a ruling, the members know this, but there is a ruling in the TikTok psychic defamation case, and it is a big ruling, and we are going to go through all of it. I'm looking for the Judge Sass. I restrained myself from reading that ruling. There is another motion in Idaho about DNA, and the amount of coverage you're going to get from me on that today is basically what I just said, and maybe a skosh more but we're not really going to talk a lot about Koberger because I want to get into that entire ruling in the um, in the TikTok case. We've got some Murdaugh updates in the insurance case, in the Satterfield case. We've got a bunch of Toddy Westbrook rulings, uh, awards of attorney's fees in that case that we're going to talk about because every time there's an award of attorney's fees, you know it's been months and months of litigation. Some big updates in the Haley Page case, awards of attorney's fees, uh, over $100,000 of attorney's fees. In that case, uh, Cardi B, Tasha K, Tasha K filed for bankruptcy and uh, Cardi B suing her again inside of the bankruptcy. We're going to talk about how that works. Y'all know because you're law nerds. If you're following all the Girardi stuff, you're like, you can do that. You can sue somebody inside the bankruptcy. So now we've got like Cardi B, Tasha K, but in the bankruptcy court because Tasha K filed for bankruptcy. Um, we've got some Britney Spears date updates, but not a lot more. They're fighting over discovery. Shocker of shocker. And Motley Crue, there's a bunch of ruling or a bunch of motions there too. I'm going to touch on those motions. I think we might do a deep dive into those motions or Murdoch next week. And we need to talk about that. So I have heard Taylor Swift is going to be doing 1989. You know how I heard? Because Phil DeFranco's wife, Liz DeFranco, was talking about it on social yesterday. And I was like, oh, she's right. Um, Mika asked, did you hear about Little Tay? Uh, I heard that things are unconfirmed. So I'm going to wait until we get some confirmed stuff. Wolfhart said, wait, we have a ruling on the TikTok psychic. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Can we say today is a cornucopia? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. As long as that cornucopia includes... Um, you know, candy corn. <laughs> if we're going for fall, we're going for fall. Haley Page, the wedding dress designer. Yes. Some of you are going to be like, hey, um, I don't know some of these cases. It's okay. We're going to cover the, um, we're going to do a brief road so far on all of these. So we will get to them. Uh, Rachel, good to see you. Loved yesterday. SPTV and Lawnards ruled. The Lawnards do rule. You guys made yesterday a very popular episode of the podcast. The way that you tell me you want to see more of something is by watching the thing that I did. And I can see it in the numbers that y'all are like, yes. Will you do a road so far for Tati? The best I can. Yes, I will. For covering sensitive topics. Thank you for standing strong for, and for all you do. Proud of my 15 months of subscription. Thank you, Kelly. And um, sometimes we cover things that we make fun of. And sometimes we cover things that are serious. And sometimes we just make fun of the lawyers. I mean, most of the time we just make fun of the lawyers. Especially if you were on the members only yesterday, we um, we really talked about the, we talked about lawyers. And again, I don't mind uh, talking about the lawyers. Amber said, Emily, thanks for mentioning the Lex Friedman interview with Dr. Curry yesterday and members only. It was so good. It is so good. It's so good. Uh, it's so good. All right, shall we? I see some gifted memberships in this chat. Thank you for the gifted memberships. Hold on, let me go grab grab those. Uh, Tina KS Nerd, thank you for those gifted memberships. If you guys hear my keyboard today, I don't think you will, but if you do, if you do, um, it is my new. When I said I had a new keyboard on Tuesday, it's I also have a new keyboard today. Um, oh, it's still. Why is there still plastic? There is still plastic. We've been redoing the desk setup. Oh, there's still more plastic on this thing. How is there still more plastic? Anyway, this is what we're doing today. Yes, like a full-on gaming streamer, 
with my cool killer 75. That's what we're doing. It's a little clicky. It's a lot tactile. I'm very entertained. Here's, here's what it is. We just need the dopamine storms kept me up last night and, uh, we need, we need the entertainment. The storms last night and then replay crew, because we love you. We will be doing, um, we will be doing all of the timestamps down below. Today will be a timestamp heavy day. I'm sure. The storms last night were unlike anything I've seen. They were a pretty incredible, like movie style, like creepy haunted house kind of lightning, unlike anything I've really seen in my life. Uh, I didn't grow up in the Southeast or the Midwest. <laughs> I grew up in Southern California. We didn't have lightning and thunderstorms all that much, but it was like, it was, it was movie effect lightning where it was like, if my hands can make light effects, um, flashy, not always thundery, but like flashy on various levels of flashy, like lit up the entire neighborhood, but silently it was so great and creepy and great and creepy. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. Um, so that's, that's where we're, that's where we're at. So. I just, I loved it. I loved it so much. So, uh, Tracy, how did your pawners do with all of that going on? My cats give no shits about weather. None. They were more put off that I was awake. So they were like, why are we up? And then they just came and sat with me. It was just so cool. Rhonda Berry, no fear of fire. Look, I fear for Hawaii with the fires, but middle Tennessee where I am is so freaking wet it's just, it's wet and we've had a bunch of rain. So no, no, for me, no fear of fires uh, where we live. Cause it's, it's wet. Was it heat lightning? I think so, but it was also raining. I don't know. No spinny air, lots of rain, lots of really crazy cool lightning. Um, I think something hit a tree down the road cause we could hear it crack. Anyway, I like weather. I like weather. Gringa Latina asked the important questions. Did the kitties move with you from California or are they Tennessee born? They are Tennessee born. Um, my darling, I can't even talk about it. My darling Albus passed at 17 years before we moved. And it was a little bit after we moved before we adopted Fred and George. Mike, are you say, are you sure it's not moist? Mike, Tennessee is not moist. It's dripping. It's, it's, it's beyond, it's gone beyond moist. It is soppy. <laughs> too much, too early, too much. <laughs> Western Washington is dry. Send us the wet. We will send you the wet. We need to roll the intro so I can recover and remember that it's early in the morning. <laughs> it's it's time it's time to talk law and shit today. <laughs> That's the outro. <laughs> We're not done yet, Emily. We're just getting started. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. All right, so... With everything that we're doing, we've got, we're going to go to, we're going to be, we're going to be hopping all over the place today. We're going to start in Idaho with the TikTok defamation case. I'm going to give a road so far briefly. I think most of you have been following this particular case with me. The way I was um, stoked to see this yesterday, God, when the California comes out, it really is just like there, dudes, dudes. The way I was stoked on the NAR of this ruling yesterday. Uh, I was so excited to see it. I was like, oh, there's an order. There's an order. Um, and then I saw that it was like 23 pages. So in the members only live yesterday, and if you missed the members only live, if you're members, it's up in your member spaces. Uh, I touched on it. I gave you what the punchline was of the ruling. And then we kept doing the... Uh, sidebars from the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. We're gonna do some more of those. I might do one of those on a on a full stream on the channel. That's just a fun, just a fun hangout stream. Um, so we might we might need to have some time for a fun hangout stream. Okay, okay, let's 
do this. Um, share screen. I saw someone ask if I was um if I got distracted by this particular keyboard. I can change the light effects on this. This is way nerdier than I think we need to know. Um, I can change the light effects, but no, the thing the thing about my ADHD brain sometimes is that my brain needs some stimulus that it can like block out. So this is, it's like having music on in the background or, or something else. This is kind of the stuff that my brain is just like, oh, it's just there. So I'm excited. So I'm excited. I'm really excited. Uh, so we need to do some more sidebars for sure. Let's see. I, I'm curious if the new monitor makes the documents bigger because I set up the new monitor yesterday too. And if you guys want to see that setup, it's over on Instagram. And you can see it. I don't know if it makes it bigger for y'all, but I can see it bigger. So that's helpful for me. The keyboard matches your room. It does, and I love it. Is it really clicky? It is It is thonky. It is not hollow clicky. It, so it's got a nice tactile thunk. <laughs> it, if that makes it For the keyboard people, that makes sense. <laughs> that it's, it's not hollow, but it's funky. It's just, it's so cool. Um, I just, I'm, I'm really excited by my Lucite keyboard. So um, let's see. Nick White said, can you make each key light up when pressed? Yes, you can. And then they stay lit up. It looks like like the, the keyboard in big when they're jumping on it and the keys light up. It's like that when you touch it, they light up. We can do all the things. All right. Stina G said, it's like JD um, having music blasted in his earpiece. It all comes back to depth be heard. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes your brain needs something else to do to like take up the excess energy. I don't, that's not scientific at all. That's just what it feels like in my ADHD experience. All right. Memorandum of decision regarding plaintiff's motion to dismiss, defendant's counterclaims, plaintiff mo plaintiff's motion to quash. Here's all that's being decided. Quick road so far. Rebecca Schofield is a professor at the University of Idaho. Ashley Gouliard, the TikToker, is a TikToker who accused the professor of like staging, plotting, planning the Idaho murders and carrying them out and having an inappropriate affair with a student, inappropriate because they're a student. So that Rebecca Schofield sent cease and desists. TikToker said, <laughs> you can't make me stop talking in one of the TikTokers motions. She's like, like, we don't even know each other. Like, I'm just saying stuff on the internet. Like, what's the problem? So TikToker, um, got cease and desists, ignored them. And then a cease and desist is like a shot across the bow. If you ignore them, then the next step is litigation. So then this litigation ensued where Rebecca Schofield sued Gouillard for defamation. Gouillard then was like, <laughs> fuck that. I'm going to counter sue you and your lawyers for every, for all defamation, malicious prosecution, like all. Just like chat GPT, what are some claims that I can bring against somebody who says that I'm saying false things? So suit them. Like I'm suing you for suing me, which you can't do. So she countersues or tries to countersue the professor and all of the lawyers. So the motion to dismiss goes toward Rebecca Schofield. We are dismissing or we are asking, we, they, are asking to dismiss the case against Schofield. Then they are asking to quash the summons for the attorneys because they're arguing, hey, as to the professor, you can't sue her for this. So yeet. As to us, we haven't even been sued yet because you can't sue us that way. You did it wrong. You can't just join us. Yeet. So those are the two motions that we are dealing with. They are all motions brought by the professor against the TikToker, whom is representing themselves pro se. Representing oneself pro se can be expensive and annoying for the other party because it tends not to, to not go anywhere. So, 
pending before this court are plaintiff's motion to dismiss the counterclaims and plaintiff's motion to quash the summons for the lawyers. Having carefully considered the record and participated in oral argument. Oh, the court thoroughly participated in oral argument. The court was the court was just asking questions to keep the TikToker on track. I found the court to be tremendously patient. Tremendously patient. The court grants both motions. Ah! You guys are right. I didn't have my screen shared. Worse. I'm the worst. We're professionals here. It's, we're starting early with the nonsense from Emily. Apologies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Plaintiff's motion to dismiss, plaintiff's motion to quash. Here's the punchline. Having carefully considered, the court grants both motions. Yeet, 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 yeet. There you go. Motion's granted. What does that mean? Well, we're going to read what the court says because I want to see how much sass the court brings to this. But... Yeet. The counterclaims are yeeted. Defendant's counterclaims are dismissed against plaintiff and plaintiff's counsel. The summons issue for plaintiff's counsel are quashed. This does not mean that pro se defendant is not going to just try to do this again, right? This does not mean this case goes away because we still have to start wandering through discovery between the two parties. But for now, they are done. Um, footnote one. The court acknowledges that counsel contend that they are not actual proper parties to the lawsuit. Their reference in the caption simply reflects defendants' claim that these parties are properly before the court. This memorandum decision and order resolves that issue based upon the uh, current arguments before the court. Factual and procedural background. How does the court summarize this? Hmm. This case arises out of the tragic murder of four University of Idaho students in November 2022. Plaintiff Schofield is a professor at the university. She alleges that she never met the students and was not involved in their murders in any way. Notwithstanding, plaintiff alleges defendant TikToker posted over 100 sensational TikTok videos falsely claiming that she had an inappropriate romantic affair with one of the victims and then ordered the murders to prevent the affair from coming to light. In turn, plaintiff initiated this action on December 21st, 2022 asserting two defamation claims against defendant. One is premised on false statements regarding plaintiff's involvement with the murders. The other premised on the false statements regarding the plaintiff's romantic relationship with one of the murdered students. Defendant representing herself did not immediately respond to plaintiff's complaint by the January 17th, 2023 deadline. And then the court notes the rule under the federal rules. As a result, pursuant to rule 55A, plaintiff moved for an entry of default on January 19th. Gave them two days. Didn't move for default, default the same day. Uh, clerk's entry of default was entered. On February 16th, defendant moved to set aside the entry of default. Plaintiff responded the next day, opposing the effort. Yet yeah, that's the motion where the plaintiff called this a clout circus. And I'm like, uh, welcome to the show. All eyes on me in the middle of a ring. Let, let's go. Here, it was it was one of, probably one of my favorite things. Other than building monuments to the gods of speculation and a motley crew of gossips, Clout Circus has been one of my favorite things to come out of a lawsuit. It's been delightful. Absolutely delightful. Though, um, yesterday is Emily's show in the response. No, in the lawsuit, it was noted that sometimes Scientology calls people merchants of chaos. So that's also up there. <laughs> that's also up there. Yes, the murderous conspiracy. So... This is actually a murderous conspiracy. We're actually here. We have found the murderous conspiracy. It was just in a different lawsuit entirely. Um, yeah, so plaintiffs opposed the defendant's efforts to set aside. On April 24th, the parties consented to the undersigned's jurisdiction. Thereafter, on April 26th, the court granted the motion to set aside, denied plaintiff's motion for default judgment as moot, ordered the defendant to respond to the complaint. On May 16th, defendant filed her answer. Within her answer and counterclaims, defendant denies. Oh, she filed her answer. Then it got dismissed because it was too long. Then she had to file it again. Within her answer and counterclaims, defendant denies she defamed plaintiff because the accusation made against plaintiff in TikTok in defendant's TikTok videos were, quote unquote, substantially true. Defendant maintains that she used her spiritual brain. Accurate. Used her 
spiritual brain, intuition, spiritual practice, and investigative skills to uncover the truth regarding the murder of the four University of Idaho students and published her findings on her TikTok social media platform. Relevant here, defendant also affirmatively asserts 11 counterclaims against plaintiff and her legal counsel. Defendant's counterclaim rely on two premises. Premises. I appreciate the court breaking this down so well. <laughs> I think that a federal court is never thinking that this is what they're going to have to do, is that they're going to be parsing what a spiritual witness is, but yet here we are. Defendant's counterclaims are based on two premises. One, plaintiff initiated, planned, and executed the murders of four University of Idaho students to cover an up affair she had with one of the victims, and plaintiff sought to evade suspicion for these murders by conspiring with her counsel to file a frivolous complaint with falsified factual allegations that A, supported the defamation claims against defendant, and B, deprived defendant of her constitutional rights. If this judge can parse everything that the TikToker said into this succinct legal writing, like, literally, we can do anything. The, the, I, I appreciate the court in this. The court's like, here we go. Defendant further asserts that the conspiracy theory between plaintiff and her counsel extended beyond the mere filings of plaintiff's complaint and include plaintiff's counsel's defamatory statements to the media about the underlying lawsuit. Defendant alleges that owing to plaintiff and her counsel's conduct – and uh, in these interrelated respects, she has been presented in a false light, harassed, including death threats, deprived of her good reputation, and prevented from pursuing her likelihood. She therefore asserts the following counterclaims. We've gone over them ad nauseum. Defamation, defamation, obstructing justice, conspiracy, um, literally 1985 uh, do right, violation of due rights, uh, 1983, do rights violation, malicious prosecution, two claims, obstructing justice, um, conspiracy to interfere with due process, IIED, IIED, multinational press release. So the two claims of uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Plaintiffs move to dismiss each of these claims against her, footnote two. The motion to dismiss does not speak to defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff's counsel because plaintiff's counsel contend they're not properly a part of the action, as we discussed Inter, inter alia earlier. Arguing that they are not only factually implausible, but legally deficient. Further, plaintiff moves to quash the summons against her counsel, arguing their issuance is procedurally improper. Each of these motions is ripe for the court's consideration. Ah, we have standing. Discussion. Motion to dismiss standard. Y'all know the motion to dismiss standard at this point. Y'all are like, we're well familiar. You read it in the light most favorable to the non-moving party. The non-moving party being... TikToker in this case. We're not going to go through the law on that because the principles of it, we are well familiar with. How many motions to dismiss have we dealt with? Lots. When a court grants a 12B6 motion to dismiss, plaintiff is ordinarily entitled to amend the complaint before the action is dismissed. This is especially true when plaintiff is pro se. Leave to amend should be withheld, however, if the amendment prejudices the opposing party, is sought in bad faith, produces an undue delay, or is futile. Defendant's counterclaims are factually implausible. Defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff are factually implausible. The court is just like, stop it. <laughs> stop. Stop it. And the court putting this language in here at the end leaves me to wonder if this was dismissed with prejudice, meaning she cannot raise these issues again. Fingers crossed. Let's read together. This is going to be the judge's new, like, cocktail party story. They're going to be like, oh, because people always ask, like, what are some of the weird cases you see? Nobody wants to know about, like, the run-of-the-mill cases. Either, like, what is the most horrific thing you've seen? And normally I say, look, that's between me and my therapist. But people are like, what's, like, the weirdest thing you've seen? The judge is going to be like, so can I get a witness, a spiritual witness? Let me tell you about the TikTok defamation case. <laughs> Once, of course, this case is over. Factually implausible. Defendant responds to plaintiff's defamation claims against her by going on the offensive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what happened. Alleging that those claims, as well as statements made by plaintiff's counsel to the media about those claims, are themselves defamatory. 
Yes. And purposely brought by plaintiff and her counsel to systematically deprive defendant of her constitutional rights to free speech and due process. Oh, and her freedom of religion. Certain of defendants' counterclaims reflect these beliefs. Alongside related counterclaims for malicious prosecution and IIED, together the counterclaims presume, presume and depend upon an alternate version of events surrounding the murder of the four University of Idaho students, namely that plaintiff orchestrated the murders, then colluded with counsel to bring this action against defendant to silence her clairvoyant insight into the true extent of plaintiff's involvement. The problem with this theory, however, thank you, Your Honor. The problem with this theory, however, is that there are there is no objective basis to believe that plaintiff did the things that defendant publicly and repeatedly claims she did. No objective basis. When the court asked in the motion, when the court said to TikToker, what are the facts here? The objective facts. And the TikToker is like, no, I truly believe this. I attended the court proceeding remotely. The court asked, what are the facts? Do you want to know what the response was? She's a professor at the university and they were students. That, that, that. That. And I'm somebody who who really does love a tarot card, a tarot card reader, and a psychic. You just can't use those things to accuse people of murder. No, you cannot. So, <laughs> the chat. Emily, those are facts. Sheesh, I know. Those are facts. Those are facts. <laughs> The facts, y'all, the facts. <sighs> so. I like that the court is strongly setting some boundaries on online behavior. And the court didn't say, note that this federal judge did not say, oh, but it's on TikTok. Everybody knows things on TikTok are just entertainment and opinion. Thank you, Your Honor, for not going that route. We'll talk about Nate the Lawyer's lawsuit more probably next week. So. The problem with this theory, however, is there's no objective basis in reality to believe that plaintiff did the things defendant publicly and repeatedly claims she did. Defendant insists that her intuitive abilities, spiritual acuity, and investigative skills into the murders uh, led her to plaintiff. Specifically, she claims during her, quote, spiritual we research she was quote intuitively led to the university of history uh university of idaho history department this is how she broke this down in her motion and quote spiritually inquired into each person listed on the history's department webpage seeking their role in the murders as defendant describes it the insight into plaintiff in particular revealed that she was in a relationship with one of the victims that broke up and that she initiated the murders planned the murders and hired help to carry out the plan the result of defendant's spiritual investigation represented the only support for defendant's belief that plaintiff masterminded the murders. Excuse me. And correspondingly, the only justification for defendant's counterclaims against her. Significantly, only defendant has these opinions about plaintiff. The court is unaware of similar claims from any other sources or the existence of any independent evidence remotely suggesting the same. When pressed for corroboration during oral argument, defendant merely responded that she believed her allegations about plaintiff were true and that with discovery, she could find evidence that bears this out. Defendant also claimed that plaintiff, as a professor at the university, possibly knew the deceased students and was involved in their murders. She said that. Footnote three. Defendant further stated that plaintiff could have been involved in the murders because similar murders had taken place at the University of Idaho in the past, past, but defendant was unable to recall the particulars of the claim before ultimately agreeing that it was not relevant to the incent action. That happened too. I love that the court called it out and was like, you're reaching. Girl, it's a stretch. Without more, these explanations do not support a plausible claim under Tombly, and I have no idea 
Paul. To begin, defendant cannot use discovery as a fishing expedition, I said that two weeks ago, to find facts that might validate her counterclaims. This ready-aim-fire approach is not permitted under the federal rules. Moreover, on a motion to dismiss, courts generally may not consider materials including discovery other than the complaint's allegations. Yeah, a motion to dismiss is on the four corners of the complaint. And when we say four corners, they mean the paper. It is on the paper. What did you say on this paper? And is that enough? If you didn't say it here, la, 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 it does not exist. <sighs> More to the point, defendant does not present to the court in either her answer, counterclaims, or her response to the MDT a factual account that would allow the court to infer the existence of a plausible claim against plaintiff. Instead, based solely on her claimed ability to psychically divine the truth, defendant makes extraordinary allegations about how plaintiff orchestrated the murder of four people to cover up a secret romantic relationship with one of the victims. These claims are not only conclusory and unverifiable, but arguably, arguably so outrageous as to be clearly baseless and thus implausible. Because the predicate components of defendant's counterclaim against plaintiff lack any basics in fact, those counterclaims should not proceed. The court is like, no, 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 no. That is a judicial smackdown, the likes of which we don't often see. The claims are not only conclusory and unverifiable, but arguably so outrageous as to be clearly baseless and thus implausible. Additionally, but wait, there's more. Additionally, defendant attributes the conduct of plaintiff's counsel to plaintiff based on perceived conspiracy between them, but she offers no basis for concerted action. She simply assumes its existence throughout her answer and complaint when arguing that together, plaintiff and her counsel conspired to harm her. At bottom, the court struggles to accept defendant's allegations as creating factually plausible counterclaims against plaintiff. This alone would justify granting plaintiff's motion to dismiss, but defendant's counterclaims are also legally deficient and therefore separately subject to dismissal for failing to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. They're bad on, on multiple counts. And then the court goes on to the legal deficiency. Not only are they factually implausible and 12B6-able, they're yeatable, but they also are completely legally deficient. Like you can't bring these claims for these things. Even if the court liberally interpreted defendant's answer and counterclaims to allege def defamation counterclaims against plaintiff under Idaho state law, the counterclaims would still fail. The court's like, even if I assume all of this, it's still a no for me. As a threshold matter, plaintiff never made the statements to the media about which defendant complaint complains in her first counterclaim. Only plaintiff's counsel did. There was no basis told plaintiff responsible for statements she never made. I wonder what this judge thinks about the Waldman statements in Depp v. Heard. Because this judge has a complete different take. No basis to hold plaintiff responsible for statements she never made. None. None so. And again, I think in my coverage, or at least I hope in my coverage, because I cover cases that are in the same realm of case, but in multiple different jurisdictions, from state court to federal court, we see how much picking your venue and how much the judge you get assigned matters to what your case looks like. This is such a different take on the case than both Judge A and the judge in Virginia who decided that the counterclaims against Waldman would stand, which was the judge before Judge A, the judge in Nate the Lawyer's case, and other cases. So again, though the laws across jurisdictions are similar, and often written almost exactly the same, the results, like your mileage may vary. And this is why local counsel is not only necessary, but critical. Because local counsel can take a look at it and be like, this judge is probably going to do this based on all this other stuff. So they can actually help guide you on which jurisdiction you want to pick if you're a plaintiff in a case. It matters because legalese is hard, bro. It matters because legalese is hard, bro. It matters so much. 
All right. Further, Idaho's judicial privilege forecloses the defendant's second counterclaim. We know. You can't sue a lawyer for suing you. Asterix, there are very, very limited and finite circumstances where you may be able to sue a lawyer for suing you, but these are not those circumstances. So, um, let's see. This goes through judicial privilege. The privilege sets a low bar requiring only the defamatory statement be made in the course of a proceeding, have a reasonable relation to the cause of action of the proceeding. That's the litigation, often called litigation privilege or judicial privilege. You can't say that the lawyer defamed you for alleging things in a um, in a lawsuit. Plaintiff's complaint and alleged defamatory statements made herein easily meet this standard footnote four. The court takes no position here as to whether plaintiff's counsel's statements to the media after plate plaintiff initiated this action are similarly privileged regardless again plaintiff did not make these statements and there is no basis to hold plaintiff responsible for statements made by her counsel twice the court has doubled down on that twice defendants obstruction of justice conspiracy claims we're not even going through the case law on this because it's just it's a no like you can't and the court's going through the case law saying no but i do love the you the court's use of the word problematic because i think if we're going to define everything in this counterclaim um, problematic clout circus, ill-advised and legalese is hard are the phrases that kind of come to mind first for me. First and most obviously problematic, there is no plausible claim of any conspiracy involving plaintiff that would implicate 1985's twin protections. Right. I don't cover a ton of 1985 claims because um, normally they are between one party and the government and whenever, or a government entity because they kind of ne necessitate that. So whenever you have one party and a government entity, those things get uh, can get very divisive and political very quickly. So I end up not covering a lot of 1985 claims because it's hard sometimes to separate the entity and the feelings about the entity and the case, and they don't often lend to the pop culture -iness. Um, So that when you're like 1985 claims, you will see them in other places um, with government overstepping uh, police uh, police beatings and things like that is where you're going to see 1985 claims when people are alleging that they've been deprived their civil rights by a government entity. Those are where you see those claims in the media most frequently. Not 1989, Chen. 1985 claims. To be actionable, the conspiracy must result in overt acts done in furtherance of the conspiracy. Here, plaintiff's only connection, this is one part of uh, 1985. There's not enough to support a 1985 Conspiracy claim, we know this. There's not going to be enough for a 1983 claim. We're not going to get into it. Um, oh, what's this footnote go to? I'm curious about what footnote six goes to because I'm curious as to what's in footnote six. Um, defendant fails to allege any facts supporting a conclusion that plaintiff's claim it, uh, complaint was motivated by individual... Invid <laughs> invidiously discriminatory class-based animus. Indeed, there's no allegation of such motivation at all. Footnote six, though not a part of defendant's allegations against plaintiff, defendant's briefing on the subject matter attempts to equate her spirituality with a protected religious class. Um, and then the court cites, cites the motion to dismiss. Plaintiff vehemently asked the court to decide that spiritual practices as in tarot readings and spiritual connections as in mediumship and psychic intuition are implausible. Ergo, that the court discriminate against defendant based on her spiritual practices. But this misstates plaintiff's claims against defendant shock. Plaintiff's complaint cannot be read as an attack on defendant's spirituality, but on defendant's false claim that plaintiff murdered four people. Defendant's spirituality is immaterial to the claim. In any event, while it is possible, oh damn, this footnote is, oh, we got a two page footnote. In any event, while it is possible that defendant's psychic abilities relate to an unknown religious practice for the purposes of the second part of 1985-2, it is also possible that it relates to a purely secular pursuit untethered to a protected class, uh, e.g. a type of philosophy. Thus, it can be argued that defendant may not rely on such allegations to plausibly show that her spirituality, ipso facto, mm, it's been a while since we've had a good ipso facto, ipso facto, 
amounts to protect her religious practices vis-a-vis her 1985 claim. I love this judge. When allegations in a complaint are consistent with two plus, or this judge's research attorney, whoever wrote it, thank you. When allegations in this complaint are consistent with two plausible but contradictory inferences, only one of which can be true, while the other while the other one of which results in liability, plaintiffs may not rely on allegations that are merely consistent with their favorite explanation. So, ipso facto, no. Great footnote on footnote six. Because defendant did say this was spiritual discrimination and that if the court ruled against her that she was going to be, um, the court was essentially ruling that she didn't have a religious practice and the court can't do that. I know, I know. Hunk Banana No said ipso facto and vis-a-vis in the same sentence. I'm I'm here for it. Like it doesn't feel overdone to me. It feels just right. (laughs) It feels just right. You can practice your religion, but if your religion involves criming, you will be held accountable for your criming. This is defaming, but yes, your religion is not going to protect you from things that you say. We're going to see this come up again in the Scientology case, right? You can't say it's part of my religion to harass and defame people, so therefore I'm protected. You can't come after me for harassing and defaming people because it's my religious practice. Um. Let's see. Accordingly, defendants' third and eight counterclaims fail to state a claim for conspiring to interfere. They go through the nineteen, the other 1986 claims, the other deprivation of civil rights claims. The defendant's civil rights were not deprived because she got sued for defamation after being sent multiple cease and desist telling her that the things she said were untrue. No. That's not what civil rights claims are. You're not being deprived of your civil rights. I hate this at the end of this page. Malicious prosecution claims aren't even ripe yet. Defendant considers plaintiff's defamation claim against her frivolous and de facto evidence of an improper malicious prosecution. Malicious malicious prosecution actions and actions for the tort of wrongful civil proceedings are disfavored and limited, requiring plaintiff to establish several elements. Plaintiff must prove that there was a prosecution, that it terminated in favor of plaintiff, that the defendant was the prosecutor, malice, lack of probable cause, and damages. Critically, there has been no prior prosecution to this point, and this standalone action still is in its very beginning stages. Malicious prosecution claim depends on earlier action from which the claim is rooted. And when the court asked the plaintiff about this in court, what she said was, we should just do it all together because I'm probably going to win. The cause of action doesn't exist yet. Therefore, defendants' sixth and seventh counterclaims fail to state a claim. Um, IIED claims. Defendant alleges that plaintiff's defamation claims against her justify claims for IIED. Again, the court has already said that those defamatory, alleged defamatory statements were made by the lawyers, not made by the plaintiff, so no. Defendant's disagreement with plaintiff's defamation claims and the backlash and resulting distress defendant allows, uh, sorry, defendant alleges they cause, does not give rise to a counterclaim for IIED. This is like Michael Scott being like, it's a hate crime. And then they're like, bro, no. And he's like, well, I, I hated it. The backlash received is not because of the lawsuit. It's because of what you said. Plaintiff is merely asserting her legal rights to redress what she believes were false public statements made by defendant about her. There is nothing objectively extreme or outrageous in doing so. Therefore, yeet. Leave to amend would be futile. (laughs) You're done. You done. This is the part I was looking forward to getting to. You done? You done? You done. Leave to amend. Defendants' counterclaims against plaintiff are dismissed because they are both factually implausible and legally deficient. And though Rule 15A2 instructs the courts should freely give leave to amend when justice so requires, leave may be withheld if the amended amendment is futile. 
defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff cannot be saved by an amendment. They are neither based in fact nor supported by law. Given these serious deficiencies, allowing plaintiff leave to amend based upon the same legal theories and supported only by spiritual intuition spiritual intuition would be futile. Defendant's counterclaims against plaintiff are therefore dismissed with prejudice. That is a huge win for Professor Schofield because these counterclaims cannot be brought again. It's going to keep a lid on this litigation. Footnote 10. The court's position in this respect applies only to defendants affirmatively stated counterclaims against plaintiff. It should not be understood as a reflection of the court's position on either plaintiff's underlying claims or defendant's defenses thereto, nor does it operate to preclude discovery relevant to these same claims and defenses to the extent permitted by the rules. In the event such discovery reveals an evidentiary basis for legally supportable counterclaims against plaintiff that would render an amendment not futile, defendant may move the court for leave to amend her answer and assert new counterclaims pursuant to Rule 15. What the court is trying to prevent is the TikToker turning around and rehashing these claims again and doing all of this again, because that's exactly what would happen. It would be like, fine, I'm refiling here, and there would be nothing new in this. So those are yeeted. The court did say that they would consider, they would consider if there was evidence. Attorney's fees is not warranted. Uh, I I didn't think they were going to get attorney's fees against the pro se at this point. It could happen in the future. We're going to look at a bunch of uh, a bunch of attorney fee awards later in the show, but dismissed with prejudice is the big part of this ruling. The court has previously remarked that certain of defendants conduct after being served with plaintiff's complaint was off-putting and ill-advised. Without commenting here on the main the merits of plaintiff's complaint, defendant's answer, and counterclaims, unfortunately, do nothing to ally these concerns. But it must be recognized that defendant is not an attorney, and with that cannot be held to the same standards as an attorney when assessing whether she has acted in bad faith before this court. And that is on the attorney's fees. But it must be recognized that def uh, for this primary reason, the court declines to levy sanctions against defendant at this time. The takeaway for this defendant should be the end of this sentence. The takeaway is at this time. That is a warning. Warning. Fuck around and find out. Additionally, the court cannot conclude with any confidence the defendant has purposely delayed or disrupted this litigation. Meritless counterclaims asserted by a non-attorney do not automatically rise to that level. But due to the very sensitive nature of this case and its impact to both litigants and non-litigants alike, the parties are on notice. Warning, warning, that the court's tolerance, I don't know if I've seen the court word something this strongly in a while. Warning, warning, warning. I'm going to read the whole thing again because I keep interrupting myself. But due to the very sensitive nature of this case and its impact on both litigants and non-litigants alike, the parties are on notice that the court's tolerance for any disregard of court procedure or basic human decency is limited. <laughs> With this in mind, the court's current refusal to assess sanctions against the defendant does not foreclose the possibility that sanctions may be appropriate later. Until then, an attorney fees award against defendant is not warranted. Govern yourself the fuck accordingly. This is about as strong as a warning of, as I've seen from a federal judge literally ever. That is a judicial, that is judicially being screamed at. The, the court's tolerance for disregard of court procedure or basic human decency is limited. This is a very, very big warning from the court um, that sanctions will follow. If you fuck around, you will find out. That is, that is the court's last notice. I have said, I have said, the court is like, here is the, here is the graph of fuck around and find out. And we're up here. We're getting close to find out. So govern yourself accordingly. This judge, man, 
I was I was frustrated that we waited so long. It was was it worth the wait? Chat was it worth the wait? It was worth the wait. It was only a couple of weeks. It wasn't months and months and months. It was worth the wait. I think so. Plaintiff's motion to quash. We're not even done yet. Plaintiff's motion to quash. Defendants answer and counterclaims assert the same above discussed counterclaims against counsel. To that end, they issued a summons to counsel through her motion to quash plaintiff, request that the court quash these summonses as procedurally deficient. The court agrees. They are procedurally deficient. I'm going to get to the bottom of this as quickly as we can because um, I want to see if the court gives leave to add her I'm or to add them. I'm assuming no because the counterclaims are dismissed with prejudice, so you're not going to be able to bring them against these parties. I just want to see how the court states that. Um, defendant's counterclaims do not seek to redirect liability to plaintiff's counsel for plaintiff's defamation claims against defendant. Defendant's counterclaims prove this point. They allege separate and distinct defamatory conduct arising from plaintiff's complaint and plaintiff's counsel's comments to the media. Rule 14 does not apply to bringing plaintiff's counsel into the case. Because plaintiff's counsel is not properly before the court as a party, the summage Summons is quashed. Uh, dismissed. Dismissed with prejudice. No attorney's fees yet. Govern yourself accordingly. And uh, Ju Judge Patricio is fucking done. 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 With this plaintiff. Or this defendant. This counter plaintiff. So this case is now going back to just a defamation case between the professor and the TikToker. There were some discovery motions. We will get to that. But oh boy, um, this defendant should consult with a lawyer and try to figure out how to immediately be done with this case. Like immediately be done. I would imagine that it is not so far down the road yet that a full retraction apology and keep my name out of your mouth and maybe a little bit of money couldn't resolve this case. But that's just my guess. I imagine they've never had those conversations because the emails that we've seen in court between these parties have been contentious. So <sighs> this court is not having it. Um since we're in Idaho, we're going to stay in Idaho for a minute. I saw somebody say Toddy posted a life update on YouTube. On where? Tell me where. Tell me why. It's going to be that kind of a stream today. All right. We're going to go to Idaho real quick. Also, one would think the TikToker should have seen that coming. I'm just saying. Idaho. Yes, I'm going to share my screen in just a second. I didn't want to keep you all scrolly scrolling. Here's what was filed in Idaho. We've gone through the objection to the motion to compel the um, alibi where Koberger likes to take late drives at night. The notice of affidavit and support. Peter Tragos breaks this down over at Lawyer, you know, if you want to go through the whole thing. I'm going to give you a summary. The defense is saying, look, this is more evidence before we get to the hearing next week about why we need to know how the FBI narrowed down the DNA to get a profile, to get their warrants, to go out and get the familial DNA to match the DNA on the um, knife sheath. So, Your Honor, we need more information in discovery from the FBI. And now we have an expert in DNA to explain that to you. There we go. There we go. Look, done. If you are deeply curious, the Idaho.gov page of cases of interest has all these things publicly available. You can read it. That's going to go to hearing next week. There is an argument that they want, the defense wants the underlying information of how they got to Koberger. And I understand why, because that seemed to be the basis of a bunch of the search warrants. And if that's the basis of the search warrants, you can start to attack the DNA on the knife sheath, which is something that they need to attack. That is going to be one of their best avenues of defense is that knife sheath. Okay, here's where we're at, chat. I'm gonna do some super chats while I put up this poll. We're gonna start. We're gonna start uh, playing playing together. Um, what's next? And you guys are gonna pick. Tell me if the keyboard's too clacky in the chat. Tati, um, 
Haley Page wedding dress stuff. Uh, Cardi, 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 not Cardi O, Cardi B, Cardi B. Tasha. This is a new keyboard. It's fighting with my fingers. Um, can I give another option? I can't. Okay. Tati, Haley Page, Cardi B, Murdoch. What are we doing next? Chat, let me know. We're going to get to some super chats while you tell me what we're doing next, and we're going to go from there. All right. Let's get to some questions. Can't hear the keyboard. Turn it up. I'll, I'll turn the microphone on it. I'm glad you guys can't hear it too much. I don't want it to be uh, distracting. It's my sixth child's 35th birthday. How did I get so old? Cool Springs. God love you for it. You're not that old. Age is a construct. Just like time. And uh, happy birthday. Is this the baby? Is the sixth the baby? Clear said, will the below deck down under uh, SH and SA situation help or hinder the pending case? I think it's probably considered in the pending case. I would imagine it's part of the thought process. All right, there are over 10,000 of you here and only 1,000 votes. Get, get, have your voice heard. Some of you, I'm sure, are just like, girl, we're here for the ride, whatever. Uh, Tati is how I originally found this channel. A lot of you found this channel. That is the first case that my channel really started to grow where you guys are like, oh my God, a lawyer talking about tea. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, going to be watching you doing housework. Brittany, get your housework done. Fantastic. It needs to be done. Uh, Crafty said, found you during the Tati drama. I'm so glad you got the Frosty Buddy uh, to go. I sent you. Ah, Amy, I did. I love it. It's so pretty. Thank you. I did. I appreciate that. Thanks, Amy. You must have been like, ah, there it is. It's here. I'm so glad I managed to catch the stream. My roommate um, has cellulitis. I am so sorry. We've been up and down to the hospital and back to the doctors, to home with meds. It's nice to relax with this Law Nerd stream. It is very kind of you to take care of your roommate. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Um, that's really tough. Melanie says, tuning in from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for all your hard work. You're welcome. Stay safe out there, everyone. Yep. I mean, weather is wild. Thank you for your idea. Charlotte, thank you for being here. I do this because of y'all. I do this because y'all are here. Kelly, thank you again for this. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> let's get into it. Uh, will you do a road so far on Tati? I will. It looks like Murdaugh is winning. We're going to do these in the order that they win or lose in this case or in this poll. I just want to say I, de I was declared cancer-free last month. Ta uh, Talitha, I hope I pronounced that properly. Congratulations. I watched so many of your lives or podcasts while getting chemo. Thank you for helping me through and distracted during chemo. Congratulations. 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 I know that that is a fight. Not everybody, um, no one expects in their life, but you fought and I'm glad that you are here with us. There are many in this community, uh, that have been impacted by cancer. Shan said the podcast with Molly McPherson was really good. Thank you. I loved chatting with Molly. I love what she does. I love it. I love it. Uh, Matt Bond, good to see you. Good day, my spiffy legal mumbo jumbo talky friend. Uh, Chartel says hi, and the floof says meow to the boys. The boys say hello. This morning, I found myself in like what the Fred world. I was like, something went crashing, and I was like, what the Fred? It is my new thing. Stephanie said, starting a paralegal program on the 22nd. Thanks a lot to you for the inspiration to start a new path. Yay! Congratulations, Stephanie. Uh, near Chattanooga also got movie lightning. It was bananas and i loved it but i also didn't sleep very much <laughs> and then i'm pissed because i'm because i'm a child and i'm playing pokemon sleep i know i am but it like scolds you when you don't get enough sleep and i'm like i already feel bad my eyes are puffy and i'm tired i don't need my pokemon game yelling at me because i haven't gotten enough sleep fuck you pokemon sleep <laughs> some nights we don't get enough sleep it's the first week of school and there's weather we're busy uh, Vanessa says, have you seen the bail application for uh, Lisk? I have not seen it. Yes, I'm going to be covering Lisk. When I'm going to be covering Lisk, I don't know. It's a lot It's a lot of a case to jump into. And I wanted to catch up on these cases because we're, um, we're, we're behind before we jump in. If I jumped into Lisk at the moment, everybody would be like, girl, what happened in case ABCDEFG? 
Anna says, have a Longhorn still missing in Charlotte from storms three to four days ago, just roaming somewhere in the city. Nothing to see here. Good luck finding your Longhorn. Does Has nobody posted on social yet? Go find your Longhorn. Sometimes he yeeteth, sometimes he yoinketh. <laughs> Today he yeeteth. That judge definitely yeeted that. Um, Nick said, please find us a safe barn for my law nerds. We ride for your horse. We need a great place for him and fast. Good luck. Um, Nick, if you ever want to tell the law nerds where you are looking for that barn, if they know of anything, you're welcome to post it. If you want to, you don't have to. Deb says, wasn't spiritual or spectral evidence outlawed in 1692 ending the witch trials? I have no idea. That's a very interesting history question. But yes, you can't be a spiritual witness. They can't be cross-examined. It's kind of like Dr. Hughes trying to read off the paper. You can't cross-examine the paper either. Um, even in New Age, occult practices, what she is doing would be considered unethical by her peers. I don't think she has peers in this. I don't. I, I, I can't imagine she takes her practices seriously in this way. Or she wouldn't be doing what she's doing. So I agree with you. Um, I'm not surprised by that. Please do a Passion of the Christ type reading of Herd Depp with you as the court. Runkle uh, Herd Attorney, Law and Lumber Depp Attorney. <laughs> oh, a dramatic reading. All right. We'll have to we'll have to look at the Tati Life update later for sure. Um Hi to new law nerd on other side of my office wall. <laughs> Jen K's coworker. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Am I that loud that you can hear me through the wall? Good morning, everybody. I hope your workday is going well. This is management. We have lots to talk about today. All right. Let's keep going. Found you well on my first travel assignment during the Duggar case. Kirstie Nursey, I'm guessing you're a travel nurse. Thank you for the work that you do. That is not an easy job. Not an easy job at all. Murda at 42%, Tati at 33%. So we're going to go Murda, Tati, Haley, Page, Cardi B, Tasha K. That is our order for now. And then we'll we'll round in Motley Crue at the end. I'm going to leave the poll up for a little bit because there are so many of you here. Uh, so you can get your votes in if you want. Let's go to Murda next. I think Murda, this is not the official Murda bumper, but also it's kind of the official Murda bumper at this point. Thank you, Mingalina, for that incredible The Audacity bumper. I feel like I need to actually turn the lights green. I need to turn the lights green. I need a green. I need a make it green button. I don't have a make it green button yet. But I feel like this is the murdacity of it all. Because good Lord. Wait, that's not the that's not the button I wanted here. This will be or blue green. It's like it's green adjacent. Let's see. Let's make that green. Let's make that green. We're just throwing everything into the green and hoping for the best. Not all the hue light bulbs do well with green. Some do better than others. I feel like that's green enough. It's green adjacent. It's not a cute green. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. This is not a cute green this morning. The audacity of this fucking man. So for you guys who have been following the Murdaugh case, Murdaugh has been convicted of the murder of his wife and son. There is an insurance case going on. There is a Satterfield case going on. They are not synonymous, but they are connected. The insurance case is the insurance provider saying, hey, we paid out all of this money based on fraud. You need to pay us back Murdaugh. The Satterfield case, Murdaugh signed a confession of judgment in that case saying, yes, yes, I owe the Satterfields money. And now he's trying to um, yoink that confession of judgment with the Satterfield boys. He's also trying to pull the Satterfield boys into the insurance litigation and recently made a motion asking the court to dismiss the insurance litigation until and unless they pulled the Murdaugh boys into that litigation. So the Murdaugh sons are now dealing with them suing Murdaugh and Murdaugh dragging them into the insurance litigation. And the reason I'm doing this is because it feels to me when I read these motions, it feels like they are literally trying to physically drag them into this case. So now the Murdaugh sons have to deal with both. They have to deal with their ongoing fuckery 
and they have to deal with the insurance fuckery, which is why we're in the audacity of it all, because it's not all even necessary. But we're going to look at that one motion in the insurance case, and then we're going to look at the um, we're going to look at the ruling in the other case. All right, let's pull up me. Did I link my research drive? I thought I did. I was wrong, but I thought I did. So now, um, the Satterfield sons are fighting on two fronts with their attorneys who are, who are, if you want to know how the attorneys feel about it, Eric Bland is, is not couched with his feelings about all of the fuckery on the cup of justice podcast with Mandy Matney, uh, and Aaron Farrell. So they talk about it. Um, did I say the Murdoch sons dragging the Satterfield sons into this? If I misspoke, I apologize. I didn't mean to cause confusion. Murdoch is trying to pull in the Satterfield sons into the insurance case. If I misspoke, I am sorry. It's going to be that kind of a day. Mary's just correcting me in the chat. Thank you, Mary. That's how I correct my text messages to Asterix. I didn't mean to misspeak. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean Murdoch sons. Also, there aren't Murdoch sons. At this point, there is just the one. So this is just, um, Carolina, I'm going to hold on to this because, uh, it's rough. I'm waiting to see one of these Murdoch courts say this court's patience is limited when it comes to the boundaries of human decency. I'm waiting for that. This is Murdoch's motion with his Murdastic attorneys. I didn't make this big yet. In biggin, in biggin, my document. Ah, too big, too big. Back up, back up. I really do like the new monitor setup, though. It's it's really easy. Oh, hold on, can I go up a little bit? I don't want to go up too high, because if I go up too high, yeah, y'all are gonna see it. All right, y'all don't see it there. Okay, <laughs> I think we have found the razor's edge of where my my monitor can go, so I can see and still not have it obstructing my face. Oh, boy, oh, boy. This is in the insurance company case. Motion to compel joinder or dismiss for failure to join parties. Nautilus Insurance Company, the plaintiff, is suing Alec Murdaugh, saying that they were defrauded by him over the insurance payment. This is the case where Murdaugh was saying, I mean, I made up all this stuff about the dogs. What? That case. That's this case. Murdoch. So with that, Nautilus was disinclined to acquiesce to the illusion that they should join in the surviving Satterfields, the Satterfield sons and their estate. And so Murdoch went one further to force the issue. And by forcing the issue, Murdoch is trying to get the insurance company case dismissed because the insurance company is not suing the Satterfield uh, sons and estate. So that's where we are. Defendant uh, Murdaugh moves to dismiss the amended complaint if plaintiffs fail to join necessary parties. Tony Satterfield, Brian Harriet, collectively the Satterfield parties within a deadline set by this court. He is trying to force the insurance company to also sue Gloria Satterfield's sons. That is what he is trying to do. Because he wants the insurance company to claw back the money from the Satterfield sons. The Satterfield sons didn't get the money. But that's what he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to do. Jolene in the chat asked, who owns Moselle now? It's been sold. So nobody. <sighs> Background. Defendant Murdaugh was a lawyer and formerly a partner at the law firm PMPED. Following the murder of his wife and son, he was convicted of killing them. No, that's not what it says. Mr. Murdaugh's opioid addiction spiraled out of control. The timeline on this, Dick, Jim. Dick, Dick, Jim. You guys argued earlier that the opioid addiction was out of control before the murder. 
Which is it? Your, your timeline is off on, on your, your first sentence there. Because you've argued it in a lot of different timelines. When did the addiction spiral out of control? Because you've argued it whenever it's convenient for you. But it happened at different times. During this time, PMPED began to investigate missing, missing fees from Murdoch's cases. <laughs> On September 3rd, PMPED confronted Mr. Murdoch. Well, the, he was also confronted on June 7th. We know that from the trial, but all right. PMPED confronted Mr. Murdoch about the missing fees. I'm not calling him Mr. Murdoch admitted to misconduct and resigned from PMPED the following day. Murdoch was shot in the head by Curtis Eddie Smith, his drug dealer, in a failed assisted suicide attempt. Or insurance fraud plot, which he's being charged with. But I realize they can't say that here because that's still pending. Murdoch began an inpatient rehab on September 15th, 2021. Warrants were issued in Hampton County for his arrest on charges of insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, making a false police report arising from the failed suicide attempt. Or insurance fraud. On September 15th, 2021, the Satterfield parties filed an action in Hampton County alleging Murdoch stole proceeds from the settlement claims arising from the death of Murdoch's longtime housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield, at Moselle. Right. Murdoch stole the money. So how does the insurance company suing the Satterfields do anything for anyone because there's no money there. There's no relief to be granted because they didn't get the fucking money that you stole. This is Alec Murdoch saying to the court, you need to go get them and bring them into court. Make them spend the money to litigate here in court because they were the intended parties for this money that he stole. You have the money or you gave it to your lawyers or you put it offshore, but you got the money. The Satterfields never got it. That's the fucking point. They sued you because you took it. The fuck? God, this annoys me so much. I... At some point, stop it. Like, so we, we need Heather Dubrow. Like when everyone says you're dead, just lay down. At this point, stop it. But I feel like there is a personal animus between these lawyers and the Satterfield lawyers that is keeping this boiling. And honestly, I don't get into how I feel about cases often. This one's disgusting. This one I have feelings about. I will, I will try to be neutral if there are good arguments here. But I am disgusted by this because I can't see. Dick and Jim, I can't see the argument here to go after the Satterfield sons when they never got paid. You can fight them in the own, their own litigation against your client, and that's what you're doing, and you just lost. Stop trying to drag them into litigation here because your client stole from them. At some point... You have to, if your client is bullying you, grow some fucking balls, stand up and say, I'm not filing this and putting my license on the line. And I'm not taking advice from a disbarred attorney who's been convicted of murder. No, stop it. And you're not getting paid. Where do you benefit from this? Why is this a good idea? Why put your reputation behind this motion? Stop it. This is why people hate lawyers. This kind of shit. This kind of shit. I mean, all the stealing shit as well. But doubling down like this is gross. Fucking stop. Leave the Satterfields alone. It's enough now. Your client stole the money. Did you get it? That's all I want to know. But now, now what you're going to do is you're going to allow Eric Bland to get on your ass in this court as well. So get it, Eric. Go for it. Get, get their ass in this one too. Because 
Now it's going to open up the door for Eric Bland to ask, did you get the money that Murdoch stole? Let's make you a party to this case then. You want you want to find where the Nautilus money went? Why don't we look in your firm bank account? Why don't we open up your checkbooks? Is that money in your pocket? If you want to count, if you want to count the Satterfield pockets, then these lawyers' pockets are going to get counted. It's so fucking gross. I'm done. I'm done with this one, but I'm not. We've got to talk about this motion. First, he says he made up the shit about the dogs. Then he's like, no, I stole the money. Then he's like, but the court needs to join these parties. The court needs to fucking smack them down. Damn it. Damn it. I've hit my desk so hard. I think I disconnected my internet. What did I do? <laughs> Emily, calm down. We're really early on in this stream. We got a lot of stream to go, girl. On February 2nd, 2018, Satterfield fainted and fell down the front steps at his residence in Colton. That's not been proven because your client told everyone that she fell over the dogs. So are you to tell me, are you to tell me that from the day Gloria Satterfield died, that Alec Murdaugh in his brain was like, if I say that she fell over the dogs and there's absolute insurance liability, and then I can bilk my insurance company and steal. Did he decide this while Gloria Satterfield was in the hospital between the time she fell and the time she died? Is that when he decided to steal from his insurance company at the expense of her sons? Is that when he decided? Because now... It's that she fainted. So now in this filing, he's essentially admitting to what the insurance company is saying. The insurance company is saying the only reason we paid out this amount of money is because fraud. And he's admitting it in this filing. Tell me how he's not admitting it in this filing. Uh, if I'm wrong, please tell me. Because he's now admitting that the dog story is completely made up. I mean, he admitted in the last filing too. And that she fainted and fell and his insurance company never should have paid out. Well, the money went to you, bro. <clears throat> Where's my fucking goat? <coughs> Murdoch was not present when she fell, but he arrived at the scene before EMS. I wonder if it's because he was using his lights and sirens. How did he get there so fast? How did he get there before EMS? Well, in the hospital, she suffered a stroke and died on February 26, 2018. She survived by her sons. I'm not mad at the double space after the period, though. So. But it's not consistent, and that annoys me. Murdoch claimed that Satterfield briefly regained consciousness before EMS arrived and told him, but no one else, that the dogs caused her fall, thereby implicating over $5.5 million insurance company Primary and 500,000 from Lloyds of London and umbrella coverage of 500 under Nautilus. No dogs were mentioned or heard in the background in the 911 call. That's a fact. There were no dogs at the scene when first responders arrived. No witness ever said dogs were at the scene. And Ms. Satterfield never told anyone the dogs tripped her, except purportedly once to Mr. Murdoch when no one else was around. In fact, she later stated she did not know why she felt because he was lying then. Was he lying then? Because that's the entire basis of the insurance company. So he's just admitted. He's just admitted the entire, the entirety of the insurance case. The insurance case should just be like, okay, so your honor, can we just go to summary judgment? He's admitted that it was fraud on the insurance company. And I think if you're Creighton Waters, this is an admission for the criminal case as well. Right? Like just plead this out. I mean, he's not getting out of prison ever. Just plead the insurance case out. 
Mr. Murdaugh did not mention anything about dogs tripping Satterfield until well after her fall. As an experienced personal injury lawyer, he knew if dogs tripped her, South Carolina law would impose strict liability against him, and he had $5.5 million of insurance companies. So when did you decide to steal from them? Having invented the predicate for liability, Murdaugh pursued Satterfield's son to a, uh, assert a claim against his insurance. During the prosecution of the claim, Murdaugh decided to steal the proceeds. I imagine he decided to steal the proceeds well before that when he initiated the lie. Otherwise, why lie? Otherwise, why not say, um, I, I'm so deeply sorry that your mom passed away on my property. She fell. This is a tragic accident. There is not one scintilla, there is not a scintilla of evidence that Murdaugh ever told any other defendant in this action or anyone else that he invented the story about the dogs or that they otherwise knew he invented the story until after his arrest years later. There's no evidence to believe he ever told them because doing so could not advance his fraudulent scheme in any way. It could only risk thwarting it. In fact, he invented the story about the dogs well before Chad Westendorf and Palmetto State Bank were ever involved with the claim. You're trying to protect Westendorf and Palmetto State Bank? You're trying to protect the co-defendants? You're just trying to take the fall for everybody, huh? Well, you're already in prison. Not far to fall. Lloyds of London issued the settlement. God damn it. I should have left this one to last. Lloyds of London issued a settlement check for um for 500000 It went into the fake forge account. On March 22nd, Nautilus agreed to pay $3.8 million of the $5 million limit. Westendorf signed a release of claims against Murdaugh as his personal representative of the estate. This all of this was bullshit. Acknowledging the receipt of the settlement and the Lloyds of London check distributed to Forge. They're trying to say Westendorf just didn't know. On October 13th, two and a half years after the Nautilus claim payment, Judge Newman issued arrest warrants for Murdaugh, obtaining property by false pretenses. Those charges arose from law enforcement's investigation and a plaintiff's allegation uh, in this case that Murdaugh misappropriated the settlement funds. The affidavit supporting uh, the warrant concerned Murdaugh's theft of the Nautilus claims tell me again why you need the satterfield sons in this case then if you stole it and you're admitting to stealing it the affidavit goes on to describe how murdoch stole the funds by having the settlement checks payable to fake forge murdoch was arrested when he left drug rehab the warrants became public the Satterfield Party's lawsuit originally alleged only the $500,000 Lloyds of London settlement. That's what Mandy Matney had uncovered and was reporting on. That's all they knew about. They only alleged that because that's all they knew about. You know why that's all they knew about? Hold on. I'm going to tell you why that's all they knew about. They only knew about the $500,000 because the rest, well, that too, was stolen. And it wasn't filed with the court. So how could they know he also got over $3.8 million? They barely knew he got the $500,000, and that's because of a court filing found by a reporter. They didn't know because they didn't get the money, so why are they necessary parties in this case? Oh, wait, they're not, in my opinion. Uh, Miguelina, let's leave the poll up a little bit longer. Though it's not changing too much. There's only 4,000 votes with over 10,000 people in here. People might have opinions on what's next. <sighs> It did not allege anything about the dogs. Instead, stating the details of the fall were unknown. In October, the Satterfield parties moved for appointment of co-receivers. The motion was simultaneously made in other civil actions against Murdaugh. Uh, December 2021, the Satterfield parties amended their complaint to add allegations about the Nautilus settlement, Bank of America, Curtis Eddie Smith, and further details about the scheme. Murdaugh's statement about the dogs is mentioned in passing. Two days after that, Murdaugh and the Satterfield parties agreed to a $4.3 million confession of judgment with setoffs for amounts previously paid by other defendants. Oh, you mentioned it here. You're trying to get it removed in the other court, which at the time was already more than the amount of the confessed judgment. Thus, the confession would not actually require Murdaugh to pay anything. A day later, Palmetto State Bank settled with the Satterfield parties at a December 2021 bond hearing. Counsel for the Satterfield parties stated $7.5 million had been recovered to date. In the following months, the Satterfield parties settled with Bank of America and Mr. Fleming and his law firm. 
The amounts are not publicly known in addition to the 7.5 million. You know what this tells me? They have the money to fucking fight with you over all of this. Execution and entry of the confession of judgment was delayed at the request of the Satterfield parties and by the need for receivership approval of the confession of judgment. The co-receivers filed a proposed confession of judgment on March 24th, 2022, which was executed on May 27th. Mr. Murdoch has since filed a motion to set the confessed judgment aside. That was denied yesterday. Arguing the confessed judgment is void for failure to comply with South Carolina law. The motion is currently pending. When this was filed, it was currently pending. Today, it is no longer currently pending. Meanwhile, on April 22nd, Nautilus filed the present action seeking declaratory relief to adjudicate Murdoch's privileged assertions regarding the claims filed in the Satterfield matter. I'm going to have to do a whole podcast on this, I think. On May 1st, Murdoch answered the amended complaint. In his answer, Murdoch admits he invented the story about the dogs knocking Satterfield down for the purpose of causing Lloyds of London and Nautilus to pay the settlement that he then stole. I added that addendum there. I fixed it for you. He further admits that he stole the settlement proceedings by persuading others to dis, uh, disperse funds payable to Forge, meaning Forge Consulting, which he caused to be deposited in fake Forge. Um, the Satterfield, please tell me, argument, the Satterfield parties are necessary. You've barely mentioned the Satterfield parties throughout that entire recitation of fact. They didn't get the money. Your client admitted to stolen it. How are they a necessary party? I, I am not... I, I I am pretty pretty able to see both sides of a thing. You're not helping me see both sides of this one. How are they necessary? If they got the money, yeah. But they didn't get the money. The Satterfield parties assert the claim payment was properly paid by Nautilus. Footnote one. Although the Satterfield parties might uh, might claim to be agnostic as to, excuse me, as to the proprietary, as to, uh, although the Satterfield parties might claim to be agnostic as to the proprietary, the propriety of the claim, sorry, I keep saying proprietary and it's not the right word, the propriety of the claim payment, they can hardly take the position that Nautilus made a payment intended for their benefit only because it was fraudulently induced to do so while simultaneously asserting a legal right to receive the payout. So if I understand what they are saying, I see lots of motions for code red. I like it better than the green, I gotta be honest. We'll go red in a minute. The argument, I don't think they're necessary parties, but the argument is that Alec Murdaugh Okay, we're going to watch me walk this through in real time. This is what I think they're trying to argue. That the only reason Alex signed the confession of judgment with the Satterfields in the other case for over $4 million is on the assumption that they were entitled to a payout because their mother fell at his property and that they were entitled to a payout. Alec Murdaugh is now arguing that he lied about all of it and it was fraudulent and they were never entitled to a payout for her falling and dying at the property because they are now asserting that she fainted and therefore it is not a proper claim against the property insurance. So their argument is that the Satterfield claims are not entitled to the confession of judgment and the Satterfield parties cannot try to enforce that confession of judgment in the other case because the Nautilus money never should have been paid. So they can't sue Alec Murdaugh over the Nautilus money because the Nautilus money never should have been paid to anyone ever. Because it was all his fraud. So he's saying, I defrauded Nautilus for the benefit of Satterfields. They never got the benefit. They didn't get the money. But you can't sue me to enforce that benefit of the bargain because it's fraud. The Satterfield parties are arguing you're a lying liar that lies and you're just saying that now to try to get out from having the confession of judgment for $3 million or a judgment against you by Nautilus and a confession of judgment against the Satterfield boys. Because Murdaugh's looking at owing over $3.8 million back to Nautilus, plus the $500,000 from Lloyd's, plus the $4 million to the Satterfield. So for 
five, six, seven, eight, nine million dollars ish. So they're saying you're lying now, not then. And he's saying I lied then, not now. But if he lied then, not now, Murdoch benefits to the tune of nine million dollars. So, um, the question is, what kind of diluted logic is this? Lawyer. Lawyer. This is lawyer. This is lawyer. He is saying, I lied originally, so it's all fraud. And if it's all fraud, then I don't have to pay any of it. Like, I have to pay back the insurance company, but I don't have to pay the Satterfields. So the Satterfields are in the position where they have to argue that the original argument is the true one. And this is why they are now trying to drag the set. I still don't think the Satterfield parties are necessary parties here. We're going code red. Because it is, it is. We are at level what the fuck. Code red is flashy. When the music plays, the flashy stops. So if you are light sensitive, wait till the music stops and then it is safe. In the comments, life can't make this stuff up, said I think local attorneys would take the Satterfield case pro bono. They said they weren't continuing to charge them for some of this stuff. Uh, Eric Bland said that. I don't remember where Eric Bland said that, but Eric Bland has said that. Shouldn't the claim Murdoch is making be denied because he's not coming to court with clean hands? That's part of the argument, but not with regard to the insurance company. The insurance company is arguing they've been defrauded. That's the whole point, that he doesn't have clean hands. So the insurance company and the Satterfield boys are now pitted against each other, essentially. Because the insurance company is having to argue this was all fraud. We we should never have paid him $3.8 million and he stole it. And the Satterfields are saying, no, she slipped and she fell because of the dogs. That wasn't the fraud. The fraud was not in inducing the claim to be paid. The fraud was in stealing the claim once it was paid. Those are a really big distinction, but it feels like a very little distinction, but it's a big distinction. So that's... The Murdaugh camp is arguing he lied He lied and stole all the way at the beginning so he doesn't owe the, the Satterfields anything because they're never entitled to a claim. Which, if she didn't fall over dogs, they might not have been entitled to recover. They might have recovered less. The insurance company wouldn't have paid this out for $3 million. Absolutely wouldn't have. They'd been like, it's, it's really tragic, but um, if you had a medical circumstance and fell... That's not, we're not covering that with homeowner's insurance. And that's what Murdoch's arguing here. It feels very personal. All of it does. All right, let's put this back up. Keep going through the audacity. Hopefully I explain the argument, even if you guys find it distasteful, which I can see that you do. I hope that I made it clear what's being argued so you know what to be mad at. <laughs> The arguments between when Murdoch lied. I still don't see how they're necessary parties. The Satterfield parties assert the claim payment was properly paid by Nautilus, but Murdoch intercepted the payment and stole it. Yeah. If true, Murdoch would owe money to the Satterfield parties, but Nautilus would have no damages. Other persons are at, yeah, they sum it up pretty well. That part I agree with. Other per, I agree with the summary. Other persons or entities who allegedly helped Murdoch intercept and steal the money could also be liable if those allegations are proven. Nautilus claims Murdoch invented the claim to steal the money from Nautilus by false pretenses, using the Satterfield parties as unknown quote-unquote patsies. No, they were just the, in the intended payors, and he intercepted it. <sighs> Using them as unknowing, quote unquote, patsies from whom Mr. Murdoch could intercept. I, there's got to be a better phrase for it. Anyway, Mr. Murdoch could intercept the payment by Nautilus, taking advantage of their trust and vulnerability. If true, Murdoch would owe the money to Nautilus. 
He likely also committed a tort against the Satterfields, but their damages would be the harm resulting from Murdoch taking advantage of them as part of the insurance fraud, not the amount of money he was able to steal from Nautilus. The Satterfield parties would have no valid claim to any portion of the proceeds from his insurance fraud and should not complain that Murdoch failed to deliver a portion of the proceeds of the fraud to them, which is what they're complaining in the other case. But he already signed a confession of judgment, so it's kind of moot for me. Moot. Point. Why sign the confession of judgment then, other than to continue to use them? If you defrauded your insurance company, why sign a $4.3 million confession of judgment? It goes against this argument. Their claims against Murdoch would be best stated as a complaint for intentional infliction of emotional distress in South Carolina called outrage, an apt word for Murdoch's conduct. Well, we agree. Holy shit. I agree with Dick and Jim. Outrage is the proper word for Murdoch's conduct. They do summarize it well at this point. So I appreciate that. I hate the argument, but they summarize it well. I still don't see why you need the Satterfield parties in this case. Argue this in the other case. Oh, wait, you can't. You can't argue this in the other case because your client already signed a confession of judgment, which you must have advised him on. He's stuck with his actions. Sometimes, sometimes in this world, choices, actions, and decisions have consequences. You signed a confession of judgment. That indicates that your client believed in some way that there was a reason to confess judgment and not say, hey, I don't owe, I just stole from my insurance company. Like, I don't owe the Satterfields anything because it was all a fraud. That's not what happened there. They're trying to align Murdaugh and Nautilus against the Satterfields. The Satterfield parties claim the former is true, that Murdaugh stole the same $3.8 million from them that Nautilus seeks to recover in this action. They have a judgment against him for stealing the same $3.8 million. If Mr. Murdaugh's pending rule motion is successful, they will have a pending lawsuit claiming the same money. They, it was not successful. Newsflash. The Satterfield parties claim interest in the subject of this action and therefore expose Murdoch to substantial risk of incurring double, multiple, or otherwise inconsistent obligations. I think we're going to see the Satterfields argue that that's not true and that his damages are beyond that. But they're now saying that they're all fighting over the same pool of money. So he doesn't, they're arguing that Murdoch does not owe $3.8 million to Nautilus and to the Satterfields. And that's why they all need to be in one thing. Of course, the risk cannot affect Murdoch's quality of life. He is in prison, and every asset he once had is in the custody of receivers the Satterfield parties requested. If Nautilus obtains a judgment against Murdoch with no offsets for third-party recoveries that the Satterfields have obtained, the only effect would be reduced funds available to Murdoch's many other victims. Don't pretend. You're trying to now leverage the other victims against the Satterfields. Banks and others paid restitution for the money Murdoch stole because they realized they might share liability with Murdoch for his thefts. They paid the restitution to the Satterfields because they thought Murdoch stole the money. Had they known the money was stolen from someone else, they presumably would have paid that someone else, someone else being Nautilus. <sighs> it is not Murdoch's burden to show the Satterfield parties owe anything to Nautilus. But Murdoch's burden is to show that the Satterfield party's claim that he stole the claim payment from them is inconsistent with Nautilus's claim that he stole the claim payment from Nautilus. They're trying to drag them in, saying that, Your Honor, the only way this case can go forward is if the Satterfield parties are in it. And that is what's happening in the Nautilus insurance case. In the Satterfield versus Murdoch case, the confession of judgment stands. So that motion was denied. This is going to continue to be fought back and forth. Are we ready to move on to Tati? I'm just, the whole thing is so frustrating. I, I still don't see how they get to the Satterfield boys being necessary parties. I want to go back and look at the Satterfield case um, and see what the allegations are to see if there's all the uh, infliction 
and to see if there's punitive damages in there in the confession of judgment or if the confession of judgment is simply you got an insurance payout that was supposed to go to us as your lawyer and that insurance payment didn't go to us so you now owe us that money. I need to go I need to go look at that again because there are going to be some legal arguments there that I'm going to have to parse my feelings from because it all feels gross to me. But I really am curious if it's just over that same lump of funds, there are some arguments there. Uh, I will parse that in maybe a podcast episode. Maybe that would be helpful to kind of go through just the law law and talk about if there's any lawful arguments there, if that would be helpful. We need to change the lights as we talk about Toddy and her business partner. For those of you, I've been in the poll now, Miguelina. Now, Megalina, now. <laughs> now, Silent Bob, now. We're going to end the poll now. And I'm going to ask if you are familiar with the Toddy Westbrook case. Um, let's see, because I'm curious. All right. Yes, no. I'm putting this up. Some of you are like, yes. Some of you are like, no. All right. I'm going to hit a few chats and then we're going to go. Hey, it's Maddie. Says, watching from home, watching while home from work with Pink Eye. Thanks for all you do. Feel better. Pink Eye's not fun. Itchy, itchy. I don't like it. Um, Thank you for the gifted memberships. Cheers to everyone who's gifted memberships. And we've had gifted memberships from Leanna G and from Casey Cat. Tons of gifted memberships. If you just got a membership, you will have a membership tab where you can go watch yesterday and all the past members only lives. Some of them are spicy. Rebecca says, Emily, my heart breaks for the Murdoch victims. Yes. Um, him being allowed to continue to victimize them. Why is this behavior continually allowed by the courts? Legality and morality are separate. And if there is a tenuous legal argument, which if the money is the same, if the money is the same, there is a legal argument. I still think it has to be fought in both courts. But if the money is the same, there is a legal argument to be fought. So there is a legal argument to be fought. It is not easy. Defending your rights in court is not easy. And it is often very dehumanizing because law is law. And the law often does not care about feelings. It tries to make, I mean, it tries to make people hold through money, but that gets fought over because both parties have rights. It's, it's not an easy process to watch play out, but it's, that's what it is. It's real. Didn't the Satterfield boys get some sort of settlement? They did get settlements from other parties that were involved in this. They've not been paid by Murdoch, but they have a confession of judgment. So they did. Where is my fucking goat made my day? Kizzy Cat, I'm so glad. Alec Murdoch seems to believe he still has power and influence. His lawyers are still fighting for him. Uh, yeah, we definitely needed Code Red. Love your reaction to the audacity. It pisses me off. Like the emotional side of me is angry about all of this. The law side of me will reevaluate this another day. Um, J. Michael said, applied for my dream job last night, praying religiously for good vibes. Zoom update. I need to put the dates up. I had to move dates and I haven't, I've ADHD it, but yes, we're, we're doing it this month. I think he may have been directly involved in the fall, but that's just me. Uh, cumulus cloud. I think for me, all evidence points to Murdoch was not there at that time. I don't know what happened surrounding Gloria Satterfield's fall. It's odd circumstances. The family has not pursued it more, so I am leaving that lie um, because the family's not pursuing it more. I think that if Eric Bland wanted to pursue that or needed to pursue that, that they would, but I'm not, it might just be as simple as she got lightheaded and fell. It might, that might truly be the case. And then Alec Murdoch seized on that as an opportunity to take advantage of her particularly vulnerable uh, surviving sons. It might just be that he seized an opportunity and not created the opportunity. And he said, Emily's so over it. She smacked her internet out. I think I did. I think I actually need a new, um, I don't know how well my internet is connected into my computer. I might need to just like tape it in there. Finally back from the grocery store and found out saying what the fuck out loud is not allowed. 
<laughs> also, can we all just agree that Alec is a total douche canoe? Um, I'm normally not for name calling parties, but I feel like like douche canoe is an accurate description. It's awful. His behavior is awful. And most of it's not alleged. It's it's awful. Okay. Let's swoop. Let's talk Tati. Have you been following the Tati case with me? 56% of you said no. 44% of you said yes. Let's swoop a doop. Tati Westbrook is a beauty influencer here on the YouTubes, probably known best for the bi sister drama again, karma again scandal of whatever year that happened in. I, I, I feel like it was so long ago that we were talking about James Charles and Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson and the conspiracy palette and bi sister and high sister and my truth and all the rest of it. But YouTube 2017, 18, 19 was a whole different place than YouTube today. Toddy Westbrook was sued in 2020 by her business partner. And that lawsuit is really one of the lawsuits that started me doing pop culture. It That happened and um, Kanye West and his fight with the music industry happened at the same time. And I was like, I really like pop culture best. Really like covering this best. So the Toddy Westbrook cases started just as her business partner suing in California. I'm going to pull up that... Where is that complaint? I'm going to pull up that complaint because it's hilarious. Um, Let's see. Is this the right one? Is this the California one? It's been a really long time since I pulled up the original complaint. This is the original October 20, 2020 complaint. I cite it often. Because of this. Summary of the lawsuit. This is a lawsuit caused by the defendant's greed. Toddy Westbrook, one of the first and one of the most successful YouTube beauty influencers in history, together with her new husband, James Westbrook, planned a nutritional supplements business split 50-50% with Mr. Westbrook's old college friend, Clark Swanson. Before the business got off the ground, the Westbrook's unhappy with only owning 50% of their business, approached business partner, Clark Swanson, and sold him on a deal. Give them two-thirds of the business, and in exchange, the Westbrooks would commit to use Halo Beauty as Miss Westbrook's umbrella brand for all her beauty launches. Cosmetics, skincare, fragrance, all of Toddy Westbrook's beauty products. Mr. Swanson agreed to those terms. Halo Beauty's first product launch was a great success. As a result, Miss Westbrook became virtually overnight a proven, highly profitable product promoter. The Westbrooks made millions of dollars in distributions on the 16.66% of the business Mr. Swanson gave them. And then this goes on to fight about who owns the brand, how much of the brand is owned. So this was a fight between Clark Swanson, the business partner, James and, Tot James and Toddy Westbrook, and all of their businesses. And they have various different entities that cover Toddy Beauty and um, the nutraceuticals, Halo. This lawsuit grabbed international attention because it's written with all of the tea. It talks about sugar bear hair. It talks about, it name drops everyone. Miss Westbrook, a well-regarded YouTube influencer, also touted her clique of fellow influencers as potential sources of promotion. She told Mr. Swanson her friends were among the most influential on YouTube and that they would cross-promote her products. She related that some of them, like Jeffrey Star, Manny, MUA, James Charles, and Laura Lee, were launching or preparing to launch their own cosmetics line. Accordingly, Miss Re According to Miss Westbrook, those YouTube influencers would look for Miss Westbrook to endorse their products, which she would. In turn, she could expect them to give her endorsements on her products. Miss Westbrook related that she was sitting in her dining room table one night with Laura, Manny, James, Jeffrey, when Jeffrey disclosed that a nutraceut 
Coles promoter, Sugar Bear Hair, was offering $200,000 to him for a promotional video. Russ Brooke told Swanson she asked these influencers not to endorse Sugar Bear Hair because she was launching a competing hair skin nail vitamin. She told Swanson that all these influencers turned down the Sugar Bear Hair offer, footnote two. Yeah, except James Charles. <laughs> and that started the, the, the drama of Sugar Bear Hair. Footnote two, Ms. Westbrook's claim to influence was undercut when James Charles endorsed Sugar Bear Hair in April, in an April 22, 2019 swipe up Instagram story. On May 10th, 2019, Ms. Westbrook posted a video by sister accusing James Charles inappropriate sexual conduct. So all of this was quite salacious at the height of the beauty community and October 2020. And we were all like, what? Days after this lawsuit dropped, Toddy Westbrook filed a defamation lawsuit in the state of Washington against a YouTube creator. That suit wilded the fuck out. I covered it on this channel. The commentary community covered it. The person being sued went kind of buck wild on Twitter. I think most of that's deleted. The commentary videos are all still there. And it went wild. That case subsequently was dismissed in Washington for lack of jurisdiction. And then the case settled in Minnesota. It was a bananas time. There were documents dropping in the Washington case all the time. The Washington case accused Clark Swanson, the business partner, sort of, of feeding information to the YouTuber, and the YouTuber was using that information to defame Toddy. That is the heart of the cases going on now in Nevada. These are Nevada companies. So the California case got dismissed in California for form nonconvenience and moved to Nevada. There were three, four cases going on in Nevada. They've all been kind of grouped together now. Between all these parties, between the business entities and between the individual individuals. Emily, it stands for itself. Ray Sips will look what are the individuals. So that all got pulled into Nevada. And some of the allegations in Nevada, and part of the reason, my speculation, this is what I believe, based on everything that we've seen publicly, is that the YouTuber threw Clark Swanson under the bus in the settlement agreement. And then it allowed Toddy and James and the businesses to turn around and sue the YouTuber for leaking business secrets, contravening the business. So they sued him there too. So they are suing him. The Westbrooks and Clark Swanson and the businesses are all suing each other quite a lot. Now all in Nevada. The YouTuber is mentioned in the suit, but is no longer in the suit. And as I assume due to the settlement as a cooperative witness, if this ever goes to trial, I imagine the YouTuber will get called to testify. Like, what did Clark Swanson tell you? What are the emails? To show that Clark Swanson was, in fact, leaking confidential business information to this YouTuber who was then using it against Toddy and James, amongst other defamatory statements. So I think the settlement was in the probably the best interest of the Westbrooks to continue to go after their business partner. So now we are just in Nevada with multiple cases. Here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. There is, I'm going to try to find uh, our documents well and truly. There's been a lot of ongoing litigation. I'm going to try to get to the stuff that I think is most interesting to y'all. Where did it go? I'm looking for the, I'm looking for something first. There are, as I said, there are multiple cases. So we've got all the business entities. This was filed uh, and Clark Swanson is getting sued by somebody else as of like a month or two ago. I didn't even pull up into that. This was filed in January, 2023. Notice of attorney's lien. Gee, what does that mean? So this is Halo Beauty Partners Company versus Clark Swanson and other entities. Halo Beauty Inc. versus Clark Swanson and other entities. Clark Swanson versus the businesses. Toddy and James versus Clark Swanson. Clark Swanson versus Toddy and James. That's all the cases that we're dealing with. Each one of these boxes 
is a separate lawsuit that is now all lumped into one giant lawsuit. Lawsuit one, Halo Beauty versus Clark. Lawsuit two, Halo Beauty versus Clark and other enterprises. Clark versus Halo, Toddy and James versus Clark, Clark and Clark's companies versus Toddy and James. Well, and the other Halo. So one, two, three, four, five. That's cross complaints. When the original parties are suing each other for everything. Um, so. Please take notice that Kemp Jones, former defense counsels for Clark Swanson and Swanson Global Enterprises in cases, claims a lien for attorney's fees and costs. Hmm. One, the file and all other property in Kemp Jones's possession. Two, the claims of the Swanson parties in the above entitled matter and any judgment rendered thereon or any settlement made by and between the parties to the action. The lien is the total amount of $69,000 for unpaid fees, costs, and interest and continuing to accrue interest. So now we're going to talk about the trial date. <laughs> I didn't intend that we, that, that Toddy would be talking about, I had no idea Toddy would be talking about this today. Uh, we've been meaning to talk about it for weeks, but yes, we'll talk about the trial day in a minute. So Paulina said, Toddy just said the case is going to trial. I wonder if more dirt on JC will be exposed. Probably not. How glorious he decided to create his brand now. I don't think he'll come up at all in any of this. Truly. Um, but more Clark, more Clark Swanson dirt will be. But what we've got is a attorney lien from past attorneys saying that they're owed almost $70,000 in legal fees. We do have a trial. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I promise. I promise. So. Clark Swanson's lawyers are like, hey, if there's a recovery to Swanson, we're owed $70,000 of that. So that's happening with Clark and his former counsel. He now has new counsel. This is not what I'm looking for. Um, we're going to go to the order for attorney's fees. Okay, we're going to talk about attorney's fees, then we're going to talk about case scheduling. So, let me make this a little bit bigger. All right, order for attorney's fees. This is from, it's been a minute. This is from December 2022. It's been a minute. Been a minute. Order granting motion for attorney's fees and costs. This matter having come before the court. Oh, let me make it just a smish, smish, smish. Hopefully you guys can see it well. This matter having come before the court on plaintiffs, Halo Beauty Partners, LLC, and Halo Beauty Inc. Collectively Halo Party's motion for attorney's fees and costs, which was filed in accordance with their previous motion for sanctions. The Halo Parties having appeared by and through their counsels of record, which is Brownstein, Shrek, and Saltz's firm. Defendants Clark Swanson and Swanson Company and their lawyers. The court finds and concludes that. Um, Christina said in the chat, wait, where'd it go? Where did it go? I know who the YouTuber is. Why do we not name her? Lest we summon. Also, I am not, I do not want anyone to be like, Oh, I'm curious if this person has great coverage of something. No, I, I don't want, I no, mm -mm. no way. We're, we've passed that toxic gossip train period of life. No way. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. The same reason we don't really talk about the TikTok, uh, the TikTok psychic by name. I don't want to give people infamy for bad behavior, if that makes sense. No, uh-uh. Nope. Hey, nope. Nope. It was a long, it was a long case covering it. 
All right, let's let's continue. Oh, there's a Reddit if you're curious about if you're curious about what that YouTuber gets up to. There's a subreddit that details it in a in in th- thorough detail. All right. The court finds and concludes that on June 29th, 2022, this court entered an order granting in part, denying in part, motion for sanctions. In the order, the court awarded the HALO parties reasonable attorney's fees and costs associated with the motion to dismiss for form nonconvenience. Based on the fact that the Swanson parties needlessly multiplied the proceedings to increase cost unreasonably and vexatiously. So sanctions were granted against Clark and company, not like multiple, like the actual company. And attorney's fees were awarded because they were found that Swanson needlessly multiplied the proceedings. Because the court has already determined the HALO entities are entitled to attorney's fees and costs incurred in opposing the motion to dismiss, this court must determine the fees. The amount of attorney's fees to be awarded and whether such fees are reasonable is left to the sound discretion of the court, and they go through it. And why? They go through the standards and how they determine how much it should cost to do a thing. Indeed, the experience, training, education, professional standing, and skill of each of Halo Entities' attorneys justify the hourly rate that the the entities are being charged. Specifically, Mr. Lamberg's hourly rate of eight twenty five an hour, Mr. Saltz's rate of seven twenty five an hour, which is probably low for Saltz. I think these are these are reasonable rates, and I think they could charge more. When we look at the Spears case. The attorneys, who I don't think have done the work that has been done here, are charging upwards of like $1,200 an hour. So these are reasonable rates, in my opinion, being charged to the entities. Uh, Miss Levine, Queen Levine's rates of 600, Queen Levine is the, uh, I was washing my hair. Queen Levine's rates of $600 an hour, Fetz's rate of $550 an hour, Chance's rate of $470 an hour, Uh, Mr. Uh, the B and the R are flipping for me, and I can't tell which one goes where. Hold on. Um, Nobria, hourly rate of $3.95 an hour, all commensurate with their experience and skill. Also commensurate with the rates charged in the Nevada legal market for commercial litigation that has complexities such as this case. It is com- it is a complex case. So, yes, the attorney's fees are reasonable. Um, let's see. The attorneys expanded 43 hours opposing the motion to dismiss and incurred $20,000 in attorney's fees. So the Nevada attorneys, the uh, Salts Salts and Co. spent 11 hours opposing the motion and incurred 8,000 in fees. They incurred Westlaw research in the amount of 776. Look, it wasn't chat GPT research. They spent $700 to research it on Westlaw. Like professionals. The total hours expanded in opposing the motion was 54 hours. The amount of fees incurred was 28,000. The amount of costs was 779,000, totaling 29,000. The court finds the number of hours expended to oppose was reasonable and necessary. So now Clark Swanson and his companies have been hit with almost $30,000 in attorney's fees. So there is that like $70,000 attorney lien plus $30,000. So they keep losing on parts of this case and now owe attorney's fees to SALTS and to the Nevada firm. So then we've got a scheduling order as this case gets ready for trial. Where's our most recent? I want to make sure I pull up the most recent one because there's like four of them because they've shifted around. This is from May. Okay. This is the May scheduling order for the five cases Five cases. Uh, let's see. Me, I keep pulling these up and they're like not the right size. Okay. Stipulation in order to extend discovery deadlines, fourth request. So this is their scheduling order. This is what's happening in this case right now. Discovery completed. This litigation centers on complex and intricate business dispute between parties which have resulted in the commencement of four separate actions and consolidation of these actions before this court. The parties conducted an early case conference in January 2022 and filed their joint case report in February. Thereafter, on January 6, 2023, the court filed its second amended court scheduling order, civil trial, etc., 
disclosures by plaintiffs. So this is all the discovery disclosures made by the plaintiffs in these cases. By defendants, these are discovery disclosures made. Written discovery. So this is all of the requests for productions, all of the discovery requests, and these are ongoing um, into 2023. Defendants, all the requests for production of documents. This is all of the ongoing discovery, some of this being propounded um, in spring 2023. The Halo Enterprises or entities responded to written discovery requests on September 26, 2022, supplemented their responses on October 5th. Halo Beauty Partners responded to Clark on April 24th. Uh, Tati responded to Clark on April 24th, 2023. Subpoenas. So these are all the different subpoenas that have gone out from Halo. This is who they want to depose potentially bring into court, et cetera, et cetera. So let's see who we're talking about. Uh, Black Line Safety I, is a company that uh, Clark worked with. I don't know or remember who Core Scientific is. Calderon was involved in um, Halo. Flavicure was another business Clark was working with, which might have been a breach of the contract. Um, Franzia Von Fischer is Clark's wife. Hines and Edith Fisher are the parents because the parents, it's alleged that the parents were receiving payment through the company. Clark had put the parents on the company payroll and then was paying like health insurance and paying them um, through the business, which the Westworks didn't know or approve. And Gordon, um, by defendants, Clark sent an SDT to Rig Studio LA, RIG Studio LA, only one. Only one subpoena, Clark? Who else are you talking to? I'm curious. Depositions. Oh, these, I guess these could have been for SDTs for uh, documents as well. Fair, fair. Depositions. The parties conducted the deposition of non-party Edith Fisher on February 9th. Remaining discovery. Um... Expert disclosures, deposition of plaintiff counter defendants. So all the depositions of Clark and the Westbrooks haven't been done. Expert witnesses, recipient witnesses, propounding and answering written discovery. Reasons remaining discovery cannot be completed within the time set. Discovery cutoff is currently scheduled to close August 10th. Wait, today, <laughs> today. As such, the parties believe they could complete the depositions, propound written discovery, resolve discovery disputes within that time frame. The main reason behind the parties petitioning the court to extend discovery deadlines as it relates to the current May 10th deadline for disclosure and initial experts in that defendants counsel recently substituted as attorney of record the complex nature of the matter comprising of four separate litigations consolidated into this proceeding, the time resources related, defendants written uh, discovery to plaintiffs, Related to experts issued April 4th, plaintiffs have requested an extension to respond. In addition, plaintiffs have indicated that they want to have Clark Swanson undergo an NRCP 35 examination. The parties still need to schedule it. In order to accommodate the examination and allow plaintiffs the time to respond, a 60-day extension is necessary. There's a stipulation. The stipulation is not made for the purpose of delay, but rather the parties' experts need ample time. Um, proposed schedule for completing discovery motions to amend platings or add parties, May 10th, 2023. They're now bumping that to July. So this is still passed. Expert disclosures, July. Rebuttal expert disclosures, August. Dispositive motions, November. So that's probably when we will touch back into this case in the fall. Late fall is when they're doing uh, motions for summary judgment. We'll start to see like the mini trial play out. Discovery deadline, October 9th. Current trial date. The case is currently set for trial for a five-week stack beginning November 13th, 2023. This will not be televised. Um, Rexy Motor said, I keep hearing STDs because I keep saying SDTs. Subpoena deuces to come. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. Um, the case is currently set for trial for a five-week stack November 13th, 2023 based on the above requested extension. The parties request the trial be continued to the next available stack 45 days later. So this is them asking the court to push back the trial date. And the court set that trial date back. Let me go find it just a little bit. Um, where did I put it? 
I need to consolidate all of my documents in this case too, because I had them separated by case. And this order was granted, I believe. Let me see. I want to make sure I have them in the right order. No, that one's the one from May. Eh, did I not pull it? I thought I did. Wait, no, no. Give me one second. Let me just go to the court website and grab it. I thought I had it here, but I didn't. So we'll get the exact trial date. But this is this is now in like the final countdown for trial on all of the business, all of the business cases. I just want to grab the exact. Wait, no, that's Washington. I just want to grab the exact one. Which is going to apparently take me a second. It, the amount of cases tracking this Tati case was excessive. And now I can't find my link. Emily, why? Tell me why. Oh, no. Did I put it there? Sorry, y'all. This is the problem with me doing multiple topics in a stream. Is at some point, something is going to go off the rails. Um, there we go. Apologies. I feel like we just need to like let Emily pull up the trial date. Because we're going to do it right now. All right. Sometimes, sometimes, oh, we have to go back and pull it. Damn it. This one's our masterpiece. And then we'll get to our other cases, I promise. What time is it? We've got time. A little bit. All right. We're, we're paging down as far as we can. There's so much damn litigation in this case. I'm looking forward to getting to the dispositive motions, like the motions for summary judgment. They'll be long, but they'll be really interesting. Uh, notice of entry of stipulated order. Yes. No. Uh, no, let's just go without the stipulated order. We'll just go for the stipulation and order. Why isn't it here? Mm. All right. Two things. Let's grab this document. First, and then we'll grab another one because there's two more that we didn't go over. And I saw a lot of you guys asking about the um, examination. So we're going to just do that right now. And wait, ah, go back, go back. I also want to make sure I don't forget to download it since we're doing this contemporaneously. Okay. Let's pull this one up. These are from May. So these are a little bit older, but they're May. Stipulation and order regarding independent medical examination of Clark Swanson under uh, Nevada Rule Civil Procedure 35. Defendants, Toddy and James, by and through their counsel, um, hereby stipulate and agree. In this case, a controversy exists regarding the medical condition of Clark Swanson and good cause exists for an independent medical examination, IME. Since we saw a lot of questions about it, we'll just do this. Um, Swanson therefore will undergo medical examination under the rule. The examination will take place on May 24th at 9 a.m. and June 6th at 1 p.m. The first day will consist of tests administered by psychologist Stephanie Holland. The second will consist of an examination conducted by Gregory Brown. The testing and examination will be conducted for the purposes of determining the nature and extent of Swanson's alleged emotional distress. So in the in the Depp Heard cases, we saw that Dr. Curry did all the examinations of Amber Heard. It's because Amber Heard put her uh, um, mental health and well-being at issue in the case by claiming that the um, domestic violence that she suffered had caused her PTSD. So she put it into controversy. Here, Clark Swanson has causes of actions for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And if you put IIED into the case, you are allowed to be examined by the other party. So 
the Westbrooks get to choose doctors and make Clark undergo those um, examinations to examination the validity of the claim. Because anyone can say, I'm so distressed, right? Whether it is or not, they want to know. So they want to have an independent medical examination, not just rely on Clark's doctors. And this is where you get a battle of the experts, like Dr. Curry versus Dr. Hughes. We saw how that went. Uh, the examination will consist of all necessary and customary activities required to make such a determination. Dr. Brown's examination will be recorded via audio. A copy of the audio will be re uh, provided to Clark and the Westbrooks within 48 hours of the conclusion of the exam. And so that is just their, that is what they are doing. Uh, the independent medical examinations will be concluded by July 10th. All right. Mm. What else did we need? I wanted to see the scheduling order. There's the scheduling and trial order. I thought I had grabbed it. Here we go. Didn't I grab this? This is from May 3rd. They just asked for an extension, so that's not a new order. But they had, I imagine they have a trial date. Let's see if it's on the court website. Let's see if it's elsewhere where they updated the dates because I only see, there we go. I only saw the May order and the May order hadn't bumped it yet. So it looks like the trial date was bumped it to February 5th, 2024. So from November to February is not a really long bump. It's about what they asked for. So there you go. Trial date, February, 2024. I don't think that'll be bumped again. Final calendar call, uh, January 25th. And then this will go to trial. So we will start seeing in the late fall um, deposit, dispositive motions. So summary judgment and stuff, those can be like mini trials with a lot of facts. They're really, they can be really long motions, but I think those will be interesting. So for all of you following along with this case, Clark Swanson has a hold against, well, his former lawyers have a lien on any money he recovers to the tune of $70,000. The Westbrooks won over $30,000 or almost $30,000 in legal fees and sanctions against Clark Swanson. And this case is speeding towards trial. And then we will see. Uh, I've always thought that the Westbrooks have some really strong causes of action here, but this is complex business litigation about whether or not Tati induced, Tati and James induced Clark to give up his 50-50 ownership in these companies because all the beauty stuff was going to go under um, Halo instead of Tati Beauty. And then did Clark Swanson also violate rules of the company by um, leaking information to a YouTuber and putting his in-laws on payroll and the rest of it? A lot. A lot of stuff. So that is an update. The Westbrook case is going to trial in February. The motions will be filed in the fall and we will go through them together then. Yeah? Okay. Sounds good. What was next? Um, yeah, Miguelina all in the poll. So for all of you that hadn't heard about Toddy, it is complex business litigation involving a beauty influencer that we covered a lot. And it has induced Toddy to close... Um, Toddy Beauty, like all of that got closed in the course of these uh, disputes that are ongoing and have been ongoing for three, four years. So when we talk about covering litigation from the beginning to the end, this litigation has not, because it's in discovery, it's not, not as much as happening as it was at the beginning, but we're going to start seeing more happening as this ramps up to trial. And then we will see what happens in trial. All right. Murdoch, Toddy Westbrook, Haley Page. Have you guys heard of Haley Page? Some of you might have. Some of you might not have. We're going to the Haley Page case next. And let's do a couple questions and super chats before we get there. Please go to trial and get a picture with Tati. <laughs> I don't know if I... Tati is a very beautiful woman. I don't know if I need a picture with Tati uh, that would make me look like a troll. Also, I the fall is real busy. And I was hoping this would be in trial around the same time as BravoCon when I'll be in Nevada anyway. But maybe, maybe we'll go watch some days of trial. We'll see. I need cameras in this courtroom. 
Um, Jenny said, home with today with my 11 month old who got surgery to get tubes in his ear this morning. Finally able to hop on while he's napping. Tubes will be such a godsend when they are needed. So, so helpful. Uh, Emily, I love your live streams. They keep me happy at work. Did you see where Jason Alexander was arrested in Tennessee for stalking? No, the act, not the actor. Is there a different Jason Alexander? No, I did not see that. Octo said, help me reach my goal and sign up for lawnerdalert.com. Lawnerdalert.com will let you know when I'm going live and when we're covering things. So if you are not on Lawnerd Alert, make Octo's Octo hearts happy. Can't believe it's been nine months. Summer butterfly. Thank you. Motion to squish Bubba. <laughs> All the Bubba love. Uh, this explains why I barely know who Tati is. Simply Belle, if you don't follow the beauty drama circa 2017, 19, I get it. I sent you some gifts in July. I sent you an email. Um, Michelle, I would have to look. I've received a ton of stuff. I have stuff. So I would go look at, I will go look at the email with my team to confirm. But if it gets sent to my PO box, I get stuff. Does it always get opened in a timely fashion? No, no. What is the possibility that he uh, greased the steps hoping someone else would fall? I Poison Elf, I don't think so with the with the steps in and out of the house because the whole family used those steps to go in and out of the house. Long time no see. Good to see you, Joseph. EDB for pop culture president. I love pop culture. Pretty sure Alec Murdoch still believes he's untouchable. Mm, I mean, maybe. That would be some power of belief, wouldn't it? Um... Accepting my no SC rule. You have a huge fan in Aaron Smith Levin growing up. Scientology. Uh, do we mean Scientology SC? Do we mean Scientology or do we mean um, South Carolina? I'm sorry. Would love to see you co-host a stream. I know he was in the chat yesterday and has been uh, very complimentary of the channel. So thank you. Um, Idaho Supreme Court just changed what constitutes for a private practice and holistic health. I would. I wonder if that helped them. Um, I don't think anything that the Idaho Supreme Court would have recently done would have changed the court's ruling with regard to the TikToker. Like they're not connected. Random, but do you have baby merch? We've been thinking about it. Been watching while babysitting my six month old niece, and I think she needs a laundry onesie. We've been thinking about it. So not yet. Not yet. Marty, do you think they could end up with the Satterfield uh, mom's body being exhumed and examined? No, I don't think there's any point to that. And the family doesn't seem to want that. If they did, that would have happened. Um, would this have the Streisand effect? Suing the partner is going to bring out more company secrets. Not necessarily because they were already out. The allegation is that he leaked them. So it's already out. Um, so, no. Uh, Jen P in the chat said, Emily, that's cute thinking AM cares if any member of his family is injured on slippery steps. Uh, I think that Alec Murdaugh does things with a plan, not randomly. So I think greasing the steps is too, leaving it up to chance. So let us get into Haley Page. Oh, this case. All right, let me make sure I have the right. All right, let me make sure I have the right and proper documents turned on. I don't know the name that Haley Page is going on now i know that there has been a name change i have not paid a ton of attention to the name change i think i might instead of doing a road so far let the courts road so far do it uh because Haley page keeps losing in this case and i'm not truly not surprised by it all right i'm gonna give a quick a quick road so far um wait jason alexander britney's ex-husband Oh, no, I did not see that. Thank you. I did not I did not connect those two. My brain is so hard. There are two Chase and Alexanders. We all need to be specific. Brittany's ex. No, I did not see that. Was stalking a woman at a gym. I'll go take, I'll take a look um, just for curious. She's going by Chevelle. Thank you. I need to swoop. Yes, I do. Swoop. Haley Page has been sued by JLM Couture a hundred million years ago, exaggeration, over her separation with the company. Very early on in the case, JLM alleged that Haley Page was using like the business Instagram. They allege that the Instagram, Haley Page is like 
Instagram under that name was a business asset. It was created during the time she worked at JLM. It was to promote, you know, yes, it was lifestyle, but it was to promote JLM gowns where Haley Page worked with them. She had been on Say Yes to the Dress, blah, blah, blah. And they alleged that she was putting things on the Instagram that weren't aligned with the company, including like influencery type um, ads and sponsorships for salad dressing or whatever. And they're like, this is JLM's position was this is a brand asset. This is not a personal asset. You can't just do like salad dressing ads on the Instagram fighting over the value of that Instagram account and the business um, interest in that fighting over whether Haley Page was allowed to use the name Haley Page in connection with Bridal because Haley Page had sold the rights to her name with JLM and JLM had the rights under the contract to um, to trademark the name Haley Page in connection with all things Bridal. Haley Page took to social media and was like, this company's bullying me. They are, um, they're not letting me use my name. Like, how can you even not use your name? Well, because you sold it, you're allowed to say your name or you're allowed to sell your name. And others, especially in the creative industry and makeup, have sold their names. Uh, Kate Spade, Bobby Brown, others have sold their names. So if you, you're allowed to contract for selling your name. And I think that sometimes these contracts feel very predatory when you are new in your career and it's like, okay, well, I don't know what the value of my name is. Uh, you guys are saying Prince Kat Von D. Yep. I don't know what the value of my name is. So sure. If you're going to give me this lump of money and, and they're really they're the companies argue the way the music industry does, right? We need the value of what we're building because we're building you. So we need the rights to the thing that we're building. It's as if you sell a house and somebody buys the house from you for an amount and then remodels that house and makes it bomb and is like, we're adding a pool, we're adding a second story, we're doing all the landscaping, we're making this amazing house that we've remodeled. And then the original owner comes back and is like, excuse me, get the fuck out of my house. This is mine. It's like, I, you sold it. We built it to what it is now. You sold it. Like, it, no takesy backsies, right? And that's what's happening here. Now, oftentimes I don't love these contracts. When we read through this, when I originally covered it, the JLM contract was real explicitly clear. It was not confusing. It was not buried in fine print. It was very clear and well negotiated for. Whether Haley Page felt that she did not have the um, power or name to adequately negotiate maybe but she was paid for this sale and the Haley page name was grown after she contracted with jlm couture so it might feel icky but they built it into a brand this happens in music all the time when artists are built by a record label and the record label's like um we own your name, likeness, image, whatever. And the artists are like, fuck that. But did, did you grow because of the backing of the industry or not? So it's difficult. Um, Just Hearts NYC said, she said her Instagram was before, so it was hers. Her Instagram started factually, her Instagram started during her time contracting with JLM. So Ali B said, that sounds scary. I don't want anyone owning my name. That's okay, Ali B. You don't have to take money to sell your name. You don't have to. So JLM is pretty much coming in here with We Built You. Different from the Mr. Beast lawsuit where Mr. Beast already had a very established brand and then partnered with the burger people, VDC or CVD or ABCD, what the fuck. Mr. Beast already had a brand. Haley Page had talent but did not have a brand. She built her brand with JLM and sold it to them. And we don't know for how much. This happens with a lot of creatives. And it's legal. And then she went on social media trying to say this big bad company is bullying me. Well, I get that it feels that way. But you sold your you sold your name and the contract was super clear. 
and you were paid for the benefit of your bargain. Like you got what you bargained for. You have regrets. And she didn't go on social media and say, young Haley Page made a bad deal. She went on social media and said, how dare they? Well, because you contracted for it. So, you know, she's still allowed to be in bridal under her contract. She just can't do it under the name Haley Page. So she cannot sell bridal under Haley Page. Did she have to change her whole legal name? No. Did she do that? It seems so. But you could use another professional name. But it couldn't be Haley, it couldn't be Page, and it couldn't be anything between that. So at the beginning of this case, JLM won a very substantial injunction. They haven't determined the causes of action in this case yet. They are still fighting over the injunction that was issued at the very beginning of the case. And it's gone back and forth on appeal. We're still at the beginning, years into the beginning stages of this case. And everything done in this case, JLM has won. Everything. And they've expanded the case because she keeps going, well, had kept going on social media. So they expanded it. So things she was doing on social media continued to aggravate this case. So they are still in the beginning context of this case, fighting over the preliminary injunction, the injunction that was in place to stop action by Haley Page during the pendency of this case. And that is where we are still. From the time this case was filed, when was this case filed? I don't remember. Hold on. It should be in my notes, the original date this was filed. Um, where is it? 2020, December, 2020. So from December, 2020 to now, they are still fighting over the preliminary injunction. They have not gotten to deciding this case on the merits. Preliminary injunction. Let's see. Yeah, still, still fighting. This is going to be a three-hour tour, still fighting off the over the preliminary injunction. So this is the court's order from March, modifying the preliminary injunction after it came back on appeal. And this gives a bit of a background on this. This is Judge Swain. This opinion and order modifying preliminary injunction originally issued on July 25th, 2022 is now reissued. It was originally, it was issued in 2020, then it went up on appeal, then a new one was issued, and now we're here. And is now reissued in amended form in accordance with the February 21st, 2023 order from the Court of Appeals, directing this court to reissue the memorandum accepting any aspects that have expired in the interim. Before this court is plaintiff's motion to modify the preliminary injunctive relief granted. The preliminary injunction was first entered on March 4th, 2021, was clarified on June 2nd, 2021, was modified on February 14th, 2022. Several provisions of the preliminary injunction expire on August 1st, 2022. Footnote one, as noted in the opening paragraph, the original opinion and order was issued in July 2022. In connection with the conclusion of the stated employment term under the party's agreement. So contract provisions expire. Expired. In anticipation of the upcoming expiration of the employment term and associated provisions of the current preliminary injunction, JLM has moved to modify the preliminary injunction. The court has jurisdiction. The court has reviewed the party's submissions. And for the following reasons... The court grants in part and denies in part plaintiff's motion for modification of preliminary injunction. Findings of fact. The court assumes the party's familiarity with the factual background. <laughs> Y'all, we've been here for too long. Haley Page entered into an employment agreement dated July 13th, 2021, agreed to work for JLM, a company in the luxury bridal design industry, as a designer of brides, bridesmaids, and evening wear and apparel. The contract provisions that are materially related to this preliminary injunction are as follows. Covenant not to compete, exclusive right to designer name, trademark rights, post-contract, trademark rights, 
the employee hereby irrevocably, irrevocably sells, assigns, transfers all right, title, and interest to company that now exists or may exist during the term and any extension for a period of two years thereafter, the right to register designer's name or any derivatives thereof as trademarks or service marks. The trademark shall in perpetuity. When it says in perpetuity, it means forever. In perpetuity, in perpetuity be the exclusive property of the company. The employee having consented to it being filed uh, by the company and the employee thereof shall have no right to use the trademarks, designer's name, or any confusingly similar marks or names in trade or commerce during the term or any time thereafter. Perpetuity. No right to use the trademarks of the names or the name. Post-contractual government, designs and intellectual property, and then it goes on through the contract terms. After entering the contract, Gutman opened an account on Pinterest on November 3rd, 2021, and an account on Instagram, April 6, 2012 both bearing the handle Miss Haley Page. Miss Gutman proffers that Miss Haley Page is a term of endearment for defendant used by her mother. Miss Haley Page is, however, a version of the designer's name. I see in the, the chat, why would anyone sign this? Opportunity and money. It's like when we look at the reality TV contracts and you're like, why would anyone sign that? Well, if you don't, someone else will. And people, you know, for the reality TV, if people want to be on a reality show, you don't have a lot of bargaining power because the bargaining power with the network is we'll ask someone else. So either you want to do the show or you don't want to do the show. And if you don't want to do the show, we'll just ask someone else. And it's the same with this. Hey, we'd like to work with you. We'd like you to design for us. We would like to build you into a brand. And we're going to give you this money, which is probably at the time a lot of money, give you this money, and this is what you're selling. And so it's, we're going to help make you famous, make you a household name. And in exchange, this is what you're selling. But Haley Page is, I think, in a better position than a reality TV star. Um, and a reality TV star, because Haley Page has talent, right? There is a reason they wanted to work with her. She has talent as a designer. And I imagine the amount of designers who have talent is probably less than people who are willing to like expose their life on television, maybe. But it's still highly competitive because the amount of elite designers in any given industry is not that big. So she sold her name. And if you don't want to sign this contract, again, someone else will. And that's how competitive industries work. That's why um, it's different. Jay Michael, did you just say housewives don't have talent? No, well, no, housewives have talent. It's just, they're not really contracting for their talent. They're contracting to show their life. Different than someone who can design, right? I'm not saying they don't have their own talents. It's just a different skill set. Being on reality TV is different. We should do a channel on just all the bands screwed over in contracts. We talked about that a lot when I originally talked about selling names. We went through all the different designers, artists, makeup artists, bands that have sold their names. Um, but we've seen this go this way multiple times over. I wonder if Haley Page was like, it'll be fine at the end, right? But it's like the remodeling the house um, analogy. You've, you might not like the deal, but you've signed the deal and you were paid for the deal. Now, whether or not these deals should be allowed, I don't know. That's going to be a morality question. Legality, I mean, if you want to sign your name, if you want to sell your name, if somebody's like, hey, here's a million dollars, will you sell me your name? If somebody wants to do it, do it. But what you don't get to do is takesy backsies if you regret it later. And that's the thing. So, CMS, quick question. Can Haley Page just start using her middle initial? No, that's a derivative of Miss Haley Page. No, she can't use derivatives of it either. So she can still design. She can't design under the name Haley Page. If she wanted to start, you know, bride brand or ketchup or all dressed or whatever, she could do that. You guys are like, what about HP Bridal? That's a derivative. So 
she could literally call it like ketchup bridal and be a bridal designer under ketchup bridal. You can start a new brand under a different name, but you can't use the name Haley Page. So, um, let's see. So started the Instagram account, started the Pinterest account under the name Miss Haley Page. Miss Haley Page is now owned and trademarked by JLM. The biographical information displayed on the Instagram and Pinterest account has changed over time. The evidence of the records shows the interest. The Instagram account has included links to HaleyPage.com, PopUpPage.com, HeartsOnFire.com. Ah, no! Hyperlinks. And JLMCouture.com slash trunk shows. The Instagram account also regularly included references to the JLM email address, PR at JLM. Was linked to JLM's Facebook page for a period of time until Gutman removed the link. Um, at times included links free download, which referred to the JLM owned Holy Matrimony, wait, Holy Matrimoji app and Haley Page X Hearts on Fire referenced a collab between JLM and a jewelry company Hearts on Fire. In or around December or in or around November 9, 2019, Instagram account included the description designer, creator, emoji maker. In or around February and November 2020, the Instagram account description included the phrase personal and creative account of designer Haley Page. The account was also verified by Instagram as the account of a public figure on or around January 2017. The TRO was issued in December 2020. JLM removed Gutman's image and profile picture of the Instagram account, changed the bio biographical info section, replacing the public figure with clothing brand, deleted defendant's self-description, uh, self and reinstated plaintiff's website and PR email list. JLM also changed the title of the Pinterest account from Haley Page to Haley Page Bridal. A current version of the Pinterest account reveals that it remains under the handle Miss Haley Page, maintains a profile picture of Gutman in a white gown, and links to JLM Haley Page, saying, Hi, I'm Haley Page. I'm a designer, content creator, podcast co-host for all that glitters, but mostly I'm just grateful. Haley Page proffers that she was an early adopter of social media and opened the Pinterest and Instagram account of her own accord for personal reasons. With respect to the Instagram account, Gutman submits that she opened the account based on the suggestion of her friend uh, who told her about the platform and how much she loved using it, sent Haley Page a link to download the Instagram app and start her own account. She linked the Instagram account to her personal Gmail account and her personal cell phone number and created her password. Defendant linked the Pinterest account to that same Gmail address. Evidence shows the Instagram account was utilized to showcase JLM's products almost immediately after its creation. Because at this time, she was an employee. Look. Um, any alternate spelling is going to be derivative and confusing. So no. No Haley Page spelled differently. This happens if you are an employee of almost any company. This is why the fight over like AP5 in California was so big. If you are an employee at Mattel and you create a spinoff doll and name it like Bratz or something. Mattel can kind of claim ownership over the thing that you created while you were an employee there because you're an employee there. Different companies have carve-outs for whether or not, if you're like a coder for Google, they have carve-outs about whether you're allowed to create things while you're an employee that aren't the property of Google. But generally, if you are employed, the things you create during your employment, unless specifically carved out, belong to your employer, not you. That can be true even if you do it on your own time. So creating the Instagram account and then doing it is likely going to be property of the company. Could she use her initials? No. She can't. So what? She can't use any derivative of the name Haley Page. None. Even in your free time, yes. Even in your free time. This is happening in reality TV shows too. If you're on a reality TV show and you create a brand, they can get part of the brand that you created during the time you were on reality TV. In Drag Race, they own the names and personas of the contestants that were on the show. So this happens across industries. We saw this with the copyright lawsuit over the famous Obama picture that was used in the campaign posters. Because the photographer is like, that's my photo. And the photographer's employer swooped in and was like, actually, no, that's our photo. And then the employee, employer was able to sue. 
happens happens across industries. If you take a job, you have to look at how what you create in the course of that job belongs to your employer. This, depending on the type of job, this is going to be less of a concern, right? The less your job is connected to your creation, there's an argument. If you are my favorite barista at Starbucks who is delightful every single morning, and you're also a super talented photographer, it's less likely that Starbucks can claim the things you do on your off time. Um, if you work at my favorite karaoke bar and then go cut a record deal because it's Nashville and that's what you do here, apparently, not me, then it's it's maybe a little more connected depending on your employment agreement. So it just depends. But yes, corporations can own you. Contract wisely. Look at what you're signing. And sometimes it might be worth it to do something different. Um, Kat says, in my opinion, this sounds like a predatory practice. It is a common practice. A very common practice. Christina said, even in academia, some people don't fully own their books and intellectual properties. Most of them don't, even if it was funded by the university, especially with research universities. Yep. So, what about unrelated things? That depends on the contract. Common doesn't mean it's not predatory. Agreed. It doesn't, but it's common. Um, and the problem is people don't have the leverage to change that. And companies, a, a record label is not going to sink their money into growing a band that they don't have the ability to profit off of. JLM Couture is not going to sink money into growing a designer that they're not going to profit off of. They're not going to. Um, Alicia is exactly right. So gnome de plumes for all. Yes. Gnome de plumes for all. Um, so I'll be reading those parts of my contracts really well. Yes. Just no. Engineering is the same if you invented something in the course of your work, the company owns it. Yes. Same with if you're applying for patents on something you've created. Yes, yes, yes. All right. What time is it? Okay. Uh, Instagram account was created during the employment. This is why they're fighting over the Instagram account. People are like, social doesn't have value. <laughs> this lawsuit has been going on for years over it. The account was first created in April 2012. Gutman was working on her fall 2012 collection. The accompanying collection of posts to the Instagram account reveals that Gutman posted several photos of bridal gowns within two weeks after the creation of the account, including photos of bridal. And then they go on to talk about um, whether or not the company helped build this account, if PR at the company helped build the account, et cetera, et cetera, what the account was used for, and... What was happening? Gutman, uh, Haley Page expressed a desire early in her employment with JLM, or early on in her employment at JLM to assist in leveraging social media to market the brands. She was good. This was a good working relationship until it wasn't, right? On September 27th, 2011, a little more than two months after entering into the contract, over one month before she opened the Pinterest account, several months before she opened the Instagram account, Haley Page sent an email to JLM asking them to let me know when I can start helping with the Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as the bloggy blogging. She wanted to... Um, she wanted to... get an early leg in social media with her company because this relationship was good then. But now that the comp that now that the relationship is soured, it doesn't mean that you st own your Instagram. I don't doubt that she's like, I think it's personal, but I kind of use it for work. In another email exchange between Gutman and Murphy from 2014, Gutman expressed a desire to take a class in video editing because our generation is responding to people that really work the social media angle. And the classes could really give us a leg up on other bridal companies, help drive more traffic to our website store in LA, Pinterest, Instagram. She explains that she assisted JLM in implementing social media strategies because JLM's efforts were subpar and disorganized. And through her efforts, they would mutually benefit from more exposure because they're company accounts. 
is what JLM is arguing. Haley Page and JLM employees work together to strategize how to best leverage social media for the brands. She, Gutman participated in discussion with employees how to best use social to boost sales, promote trunk shows for the dresses, increase brand visibility. In one email from 2019, Haley Page wrote to JLM employees, in an effort to help sales, I would like to implement a more efficient method for aligning trunk shows and stock hitting stores with our post on Instagram. Our stores need a little more help boost on social for filling appointments and getting HP specific brides to their stores. So she was working with her company, but that doesn't mean it's a personal account, right? She was working in good faith with her company. Followers saw pictures of dresses on Instagram, message to inquire about prices. So this was, this all goes to establish it was working as a work account. Um, H, uh, Haley Page, quote, approached social media at JLM in an inclusive way and often involved JLM employees in her decisions. She proffers that she requested JLM's input and guidance for content that was either particularly sensitive or directly impacted JLM so she could represent JLM's needs and wants in an agreeable way. For instance, JLM employee emailed Haley Page directing her to a website and noting they added a sash to the dress to which Gutman responded, wow, can I share this on Insta? Is it too risky? Um, Ms. Murphy suggested that Gutman say something about the Manchester event in the aftermath of a terror attack in England, provided a draft caption and told Gutman to wait on IG to do any more posts till England wakes up. So they were working this account together and all of this goes to show that. They talk about the Pinterest accounts. I'm just trying to get to the ruling. This is a lot of background. Gutman's blending of her personality with the promotional efforts on the accounts embodied the overall marketing strategy for the brands. JLM's approach to the bridal industry is to work with designers to build and promote namesake collections. This has been referred to by JLM as the personal glimpse strategy in which social media accounts where the brand name is linked to an individual such as Haley Page often incorporate posts more personal in nature, right? Because you want to work with the influencer designer, whoever that you like, more than just like a JLM brand. After the preliminary injunction was issued, the party's relationship deteriorated further. <laughs> yeah, she went on social and was like, the fuck? And JLM requested that the court hold Gutman in civil contempt of the preliminary injunction order. JLM's request was based on Gutman's activities on Instagram, all the glitters on the gram, including her announcements that she planned to reveal her new brand name very soon, re-enter the bridal industry in August 2022, a year ago. The court found that JLM proffered clear and convincing evidence that Gutman failed to comply with paragraph 3B, which incorporates Gutman's contractual obligations not to compete with JLM during the term by marketing her for their brand and cultivating her um, and cultivating excitement for her return. And then they found her in contempt. We're going to talk about the amount they find her in a minute. JLM requested modifications to the preliminary injunction. They have not settled the issues of the case. This is all on the preliminary injunction over the social media accounts. Years of litigation over the preliminary injunction of the social media accounts. We haven't decided the nature of the case yet. Right? Uh, this is going to the standard for preliminary injunction. JLM requested modifications. JLM seeks to extend the relief currently embodied in paragraphs one and two of the preliminary injunction, which is set to expire August 1st, 2022. As previously discussed, these provisions govern Gutman's contract vis-a-vis -vis social media accounts affiliated with the brand. And they go on because this case is not resolved. Uh, we're trying to get to the conclusion. This is a substantially long ruling. Let's see. Where is our where is our point? Because mm -mm -mm. the court's not changing their mind on this at all. It keeps going back and forth, but the court keeps issuing the preliminary injunction. Sorry, y'all. I'm going to just take this off the screen and get to the very end real quick. So we can get to the court's holding. But that gave a good background, I think, of selling your name. For those of you that have not followed this case yet, I think some of you are like, what in the fuck? Yes. All right. Conclusion. Conclusion. 
during the pendency of this action, Haley Page, along with officers, agents, servants, employees, attorneys, all other persons, are barred, enjoined, stopped. Stop right there. Thank you very much. Barred from doing the following. Making changes to the Instagram or Pinterest account, including but not limited to. Literally everything. You can't touch it. No touching. No touching. No touching the Instagram. Taking any action other than properly noticed application to the court to gain control over Instagram or Pinterest. Breaching the employment contract dated July 13th, 2011, together with the amendments and extension thereby. Using or authorizing the use of the names. For everybody who's like, can she just do this? No. You cannot use Haley Page, Haley Page Goopman, Haley Goopman, Haley Page, or any derivative thereof, including Miss Haley Page. Trademarks in the designer's name, including but not limited to those listed, or any confusingly similar, HP would be confusingly similar, marks, names in trade or commerce. In trade or commerce. She can use it on her credit card. She can't use it for another brand. Without the express written permission. This part expired. The court took it out. Using or authorizing the use of any designs or trademarks or variations or representative representations without written permission until August 1st, 2027, being identified to the trade or consuming public as a designer of goods in competition. That is how long her non-compete is. August 2027. She cannot compete or open a new bridal brand. If she wants to become a fitness influencer, it's going to be fine. She she could become, you know, the next like Kourtney Kardashian and talk about protein or whatever. But she can't make bridal goods. She could make shoes if they don't compete. Chibi said that seems excessive. She was well paid for this contract. And didn't negotiate the length of the non-compete, it seems. And had the ability to do so. What about Paley Hage? Still confusingly similar. It is a long non it is a long non-compete. But again, contracted for a long non-compete. Louise said she basically sold her soul and her name. Yep. It's tough. It, it Once the relationship sours, it can't feel good. So she cannot compete with JLM until August 1st, 2027. Can do other things. So she can't work at all for years. No, she can work. She can't work in bridal. So she can't design or promote goods in competition with the goods manufactured and sold by JLM. If she wanted to go design athleisure, she could. If she wanted to design non-wedding shoes, she could. If she wanted to design underpinnings, she could. If she wanted to design lingerie, she could. Prom dresses, yeah, she could. Not, um, not goods to compete with JLM. So on the dresses, assuming JLM does not sell those types of dresses. Could she design red carpet? Yes, she could. Using or authorizing others to use the name. Those are the things she is enjoined from doing. You can't touch the socials. You can't use the name. You can't work in bridal. You guys are asking, can she design evening wear? If JLM does not design evening wear, then yes. If JLM designs evening wear, then no. And I think evening wear would be a close call. This is not uncommon. All right. Let's go to the sanctions uh, for the Instagram post Haley Page did make. Because uh, the, court, the court issued some sanctions here. So here's where we're at. Haley Page separated from JLM. JLM said, what you can't do is have the Instagram account, the Pinterest account, or your name. We purchased those. We've got those. Those are, those are ours. So, stop. Um, 
she went on social media to talk about it quite extensively and to announce that she was starting a new brand and a new wedding brand. And after this, I'm going to have to swoop, swoop and get out of here. So motion for attorney's fees and costs before the court is plaintiff JLM Couture. And this is from December. It's been a, it's when I say it's been a hot minute since we've swooped into this case, it's been a hot minute. Before the court is JLM Couture's motion for attorney's fees and costs incurred with connection in prosecuting plaintiff's motion to hold defendant Haley Page in contempt of the preliminary injunction. The court granted plaintiff's motion for civil contempt. They held Haley Page in contempt for Instagram posts about this. JLM filed its motion for reasonable attorney's fees along with billing records and seeks to recover a total of $190,000. She is being charged $190,000 for posting on Instagram in violation of the court's order. Gutman opposes the motion, saying the court should consider an award of no more than $6,000. The court has reviewed the party's written submissions and evidentiary proffers. For the reason stated below, the court grants in part, denies in part, the motion for attorney's fees and awards. We're going to zoom, zoom to the end. If you guys want to go through the reasoning, I'll go through the reasoning more. But this is Haley Page being fined for um, going on social media and talking about this. Wait, get me to the very, very end to the order. So not only is this a, a huge fight in litigation, but For the foregoing reasons, JLM's motion for attorney's fees and costs is granted in part, denied in part. The court awards JLM $117,000 in attorney's fees and $825 in costs, a total award of $118,000. So the court did not give them all of the attorney's fees, but gave them most of the attorney's fees. So in addition to the fact that this is now up on appeal again, Haley Page owes JLM $118,000 in attorney's fees for talking on Instagram about starting a new brand. Now, JLM might lose in the court of public opinion. People might find it distasteful and corporations doing XYZ that is immoral and capitalistic and whatever else you want to say about a large co corporation. But legally, they're right. So JLM has to navigate the fact that they are legally correct, but it might be socially disfavored. Because people love Haley Page, it seems. I didn't really watch Say Yes to the Dress. I got married 100 million years ago. <laughs> so, so JLM has won at every single turn in this case and keeps winning and has not stopped. So this is the latest update from um, July 20th. By November 20th, the parties shall file a joint letter advising the court of the status of the appeal. Back up on appeal. Pursuant to your honor's order dated April 25th, 2023, counsel for plaintiff and defendant in the above reference, jointly submit this letter. The Second Circuit is scheduled oral argument to be held September 19th. The preliminary injunction is back on appeal. This case is not over a preliminary injunction. It's over the contract and who owns the rights to things. But we're not done yet because we're still fighting over the preliminary injunction to the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal fees. And that's how much these accounts and this IP is worth. And JLM said, we built this IP and it is worth it. And Haley Page is like, I am a human with a name. Stop it. And they're like, uh, but you sold it though. So yes, you can contract to sell things that you might later regret. The court has absolutely um, no fucks over it in this case. They're like, this contract was clear. This contract was, re was real clear. I've seen contracts that are way sneakier than this. This one was really explicit. So that's what's going on with Haley Page. We have one swoop and then quick questions and then I have a uh, kid pickup.
as is most days. <laughs> it's a crazy week. I think I'm going to do a podcast episode on this covering all of the litigation because we have a 30-page Nikki Six declaration regarding a motion to compel arbitration. So in the Motley Crue case, respondents, the other members of Motley Crue, bring a motion to force arbitration claims. So they are trying to pull this out of court and into arbitration. But I want to go through all of that declaration, and we're not going to have time to do it today. So I think we're going to have to quick bits this one. There is a motion to compel arbitration. It has not been responded to yet. What I want to do with Motley Crue is wait for the response and then go through the motion to compel arbitration and the response to the motion to compel. And I want to go through Nikki Six's declaration that is 30 pages long talking about this case when we do all of that. Because what this declaration includes are the original agreements, like the typed original agreements from 1987. So we're going to go through the legally legal of the contracts in this when there's a response. So the Motley Crue entities are trying to force Mick Mars into arbitration out of court. That's what's happening right now. I will address it further when we have both sides of the argument. The motion to compel arbitration and the argument from Mick Mars to not compel arbitration if they object. And we'll do a podcast episode on that. It's going to take a little bit more. We need to take a look at Cardi B suing Tasha K again. Told you it was going to be quick. Catch up stream, catch up stream. All right. Cardi B, Tasha K. Cardi B sued YouTuber Tasha K for defamation. Went to trial. Won. Won almost $4 million at trial. Has been trying to enforce that almost $4 million judgment against Tasha K. Tasha K filed for bankruptcy in Florida. So Cardi B has gone to the bankruptcy court and said, hold up. No. So Tasha K has filed all her unsecured creditor debts and stuff, showing that it's not really, I mean, it's like some credit card bills and stuff. The substantial weight of the debt that Tasha K is seeking bankruptcy release from is the $3.3 million owed personally to Cardi B, not the company. Because the company also owes money. That's how we get over $4 million. Tasha K personally owes $3.3 million as an individual. The company owes an amount of money greater than that, making it up to about $4 million. The rest of it is like $6,000 to a credit card and car payments and whatever. It's not, no other substantial debts. The substantial debt is the lawsuit. In bankruptcy, that's my opinion, that Tasha K is trying to get bankruptcy relief from the judgment saying, I can't cover this. I can't pay it. I need it discharged in bankruptcy for pennies on the dollar. That's what you generally do in bankruptcy. Restructure the debts. They want it discharged in bankruptcy, meaning I don't pay the full amount of the debt and then it just gets discharged. Cardi B said, no. This should not be dischargeable in bankruptcy. You shouldn't get to write it off. And intentional torts often can't be discharged in bankruptcy. And as we know from other things, an intentional tort is committed in the defamation of a public figure because there needs to be what, chat? Yell it with me. Malice. So, Cardi B is now suing Tasha K in the bankruptcy court to get the court to rule that even at the end of this chapter 11 bankruptcy, Tasha K still has to pay the entirety of this judgment. That is the basis of this lawsuit. So in the bankruptcy in Florida, I don't know if Tasha K moved out of 
Georgia to Florida, but this is filed in Florida, so I'm imagining that's probably what happened. Cardi B suing Tasha K in Florida. Factual background. Plaintiff is a Grammy award-winning musical artist, songwriter, and television personality known as Cardi B. She is suing Cardi. I'm teasing. Since the release of her full-length debut mixtape in 2015, plaintiff's musical works have reached peak positions in the charts in the United States and around the world. And as a result of the popularity, plaintiff has millions of fans in the U.S. and around the world. In addition to her artistic endeavors, she's well known for her volunteer work, philanthropic endeavors, which include helping families affected by gang violence and performing volunteer work in handing out coats to underprivileged person. Defendant produces, hosts, publishes videos on YouTube and other socials titled Unwind with Tasha K. Uh, defendant with malice and intent to injure plaintiff utilize her social media platforms to spread false, malicious, and defamatory statements. Defendant deliberately spread such false and defamatory statements even after being apprised of their falsity. Specifically, defendant made the following false and defamatory statements about plaintiff. Plaintiff has herpes and HPV. Plaintiff, and in Georgia and a lot of jurisdictions, alleging that someone has a communicable disease is defamation per se. Plaintiff was a prostitute. Plaintiff used cocaine. Plaintiff engaged in a debasing act with a beer bottle. If you did not watch the stream where I discover what this allegation is about in real time, it's somewhere on the channel. And I'm like, wait, she said what? Plaintiff engaged in adultery. And in a lot of states, that's also defamation per se. By engaging in the acts and conduct specified in the defamation action, defendant willfully and maliciously injured plaintiff. Defendant was given multiple opportunities to correct the statements. As a result of defendant's campaign to damage and destroy plaintiff's reputation among her fans in the public, on March 21st, 2019, plaintiff commenced an action against uh, defendant and her company, among others. On January 10th, 2022, uh, the trial started lasting multiple days. The jury ultimately found defendant liable for defamation, invasion of privacy, false light, IIED, and further found defendant to be jointly and severably liable for damages with co-defendant, the company, Kiwi Studios, KB Studios. Um, the beer bottle was true, but it wasn't Cardi B. The video is of someone else, is my understanding of it. So, as noted by the Georgia District Court, plaintiff had to prove a preponderance of evidence that the false statements were made, they were published, and acted with malice. This is the jury award um, against plaintiff. General damages, medical expenses total. A true and correct copy is attached. This is more damages, including punitive damages. A million dollar in punitive damages. Those are the punishment ones. Hey, fuck you. And then litigation expenses of $1.3 million dollars attorney's fees. Um, this is all the Georgia stuff. Let's see. Defendants failed appeal on July 29th, 2022. Defendant and the studio appealed the judgment on March 21st, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Georgia um, amended the defamation judgment. A true and correct copy is attached. Procedural background, and then they go through all of the procedural background. On August 2nd, 2023, plaintiff filed her proof of claim in the amount of $3.9 uh, million. Specifically, claim 5-1 is comprised of the following, the judgment against the business, judgments against debtor, etc. Count 1, non-dischargeability of debtor. Plaintiff alleges and repeats the above. This action is to determine the non-dischargeability. They are asking the court to determine that no matter what happens in the defamation or in, no matter what happens in the bankruptcy, this judgment award cannot go away. Bankruptcy is done. Debt still owed. She wants Cardi B's lawyers are saying we are keeping the pressure on this and we are not letting go of this judgment. And we are going to chase you to the ends of the earth or Florida, whichever comes first, for our millions. And you are going to pay. And we are going to hound you until you are done paying. And you are going to pay. And that is it. So this is this is not uncommon. Um, not uncommon in bankruptcy. It happens. It's happened in the Girardi bankruptcy. A lot of stuff's been deemed non-dischargeable. So that's what it is. Um, Lyndon said, unchaste conduct is one of two elements of defamation per se in Michigan. Yep. Yeah, you can't just go running around. Um, accused. 
some of these laws are old. So some of the words that we use in our kind of more modern vernacular are, are not going to fly. So they are considered reputationally damaging uh, by necessity. So Stephanie said, like student loans, yes. Cardi B like student loans are not going anywhere anytime soon. All right. With regard to Britney Spears, oh, we are running, we are running on time. With regard to Britney Spears, here is the quick bit on that. A trial date has been set for the 12th accounting. When is that trial date set? Forever in the future. Let me pull up the uh, the file so I get the date absolutely right. They are still fighting over discovery, privilege, and what needs to get turned over. And they are fighting and going to be fighting over that. They have a discovery referee, and they are fighting over discovery until this thing goes to trial. There's not gonna, there should not be a lot of motion uh, happening in this case other than discovery. Ugh. I can't type. Other than discovery. Let's see. Where is my... Let's see. This is the order to show... Ah, oh, this is the old one. I don't want that one. I want the July ones. No. Uh, July. No, this is the trial setting conference statement. We're going to go through that on another day when we have time to go through the trial setting conference statement. Um, July 24th. The order to show cause hearing is continued to Friday, May 24th, 2024. So these hearings have been pushed and we are now into 2024 with regard to the final accounting. This matter is continued to Friday, June 7th, 2024. Allowance of fees for James Spears. The court's like, fuck it, we're never getting done. The 13th accounting is continued till May 24th, 2024. This is the 12th accounting. Allowance of fees. No, this is the allowance of fees. Petition allowance of fees. Uh, compensation for conservators. The court set the above caption matter for a five-day trial on June 3rd, 2024 through June 7th, 2024. The court does not set a final status conference at this time. This is all getting pushed out till summer 2024 because of discovery, among other things. Um, Tori or Troy, Tori, sorry, Tori in the chat asked, will there be a 15th accounting? No, because the conservatorship is over. They need to determine the 12th accounting at trial and all the attorney's fees and nothing is getting decided until summer 2024, another year. So the Spears case has gotten kicked out another year. I'm not surprised by that. I'm glad it's got a trial date, but this is going to, I said it was going to be a long one in 2020. It is going to be a long one. The 12th accounting is not going to get done until it goes to trial. The attorney's fees aren't going to get decided until after the trial. And they are still fighting over discovery before, um, before we get to it. So the largest issues that I've been following for the Spears case have been pushed out. So will I keep an eye on this? Yes. Are we going to be doing frequent updates on this? Probably not. Because there's not going to be a ton of updates other than discovery fights. If something comes up in the discovery fights that is um, super relevant to what we're covering, we will cover it. And then we will jump back into it. What, next May? So, yes, it sucks. It is, but also, try, this is how long trials in Los Angeles in civil cases can take. Uh, People.com asked me how long the Scientology case was going to take, and I was like, 
I mean, if it goes to trial by 2025, that would be pretty fast. And I don't think it will. So um, Griffin asked, what are the odds of it actually going in June 2024 and not getting pushed out? This is this has been going on for so long. There's there's a lot of room for the attorneys to kind of stomp their foot and say, no, we have to finish this. We're going to get to Q&A real quick before I have to go. Because, well, kid up, kiddo pickup is finite, particularly today. So we're going to speed run questions. Badass tax bomb said, is the father still getting paid by Brittany? It's part of what they're fighting over. So no, not at the moment. They're still fighting over it. Um, Disney does not have the Mickey Mouse Club members sign away their names. I don't know if they did or if they didn't. If they did, they would have gotten a cut of everything the kids did after. But I don't know if they did or if they didn't. So not, not, sure, not sure on that one um, and have not looked before today's episode. So. That will we speed. Oh my God. Is my hair looked? How long has my hair looked like that? Emily, what is that? I have not looked at myself in the monitor because I've just been reading documents. Hi, everybody. That was a lot of cases, but I feel like we have an update. We have time stamped updates. We have a lot more to cover. We need to do a podcast on um the Motley Cruz stuff. I think we need a deep dive into, and the Murdoch stuff. I think we need a deep dive into. So I think those two things. We need to go into those filings in a bit more depth. I think everything else we kind of covered, and then we'll swoop back to Tati when all those uh, motions for summary judgment come in. I think that's what we need to do. Um, Debbie Joe or Debbie Debbie Joe WW said regarding Satterfield, had they not testified against him, would this claim have been filed? I don't know. Maybe he's wild and out. I don't know. Jilly Bear says, if you invented, created something cool, do these business agreements extend any time period if someone quits the job uh, to then market their own invention? If they created it during the course of their employment, the employer owns it. Even if they quit their job to market it, we'll have to go over the Bratz lawsuit at some point. So if they quit their job to market it, their employer is going to come after them for ownership of it. If they created it during the time of the employment, depending on the employment contract. Did your yodeling pickle get its kimono yet? It, I don't know. I have a ton of mail that I have not opened. Judy, you got this. No, I know I have mail from you. It is not opened. But I I saw that I have mail from you. And I put it aside. I'm like, I need to open this one. So yes, I have mail. No, I have not opened it. Yes, I will share it next week. Sarah said, glad to be here. Sure helps me get my mind off my dad who just had a feeding tube inserted because of pancreatic cancer. I'm sorry, Sarah. Pancreatic cancer is horrific. Not that all cancer isn't. It is a particular beast um, that we are well familiar with at this house. So I am sorry. I am very sorry that you're dealing with that. It's hard. Hard, hard indeed. You guys, I love seeing how long you've been laundered here. 29 months, Rita. That's absolutely incredible. And I love seeing our new laundered at two months. It's amazing. So no matter when you join, guys, I appreciate it. And I talked about this in our members only yesterday that um, the members make it possible. Like, I, there's a lot of comments on yesterday's video. Like, what if what if Scientology goes after your sponsors and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, first of all, my sponsors really want um, this audience because you guys are amazing. But also, we could turn off sponsorships because we're member supported. Anthony, you caught my eye. My son loves Carolina Crown. Loves loves Carolina Crown and loves their show this week. When he was at BOA in Indiana, um, they got to work with Carolina Crown a little bit and learn their choreography. And he was so stoked. So uh, happy DCI. It's nationals, yeah? Um, because it's our first week of school, we didn't go up to see nationals. What would happen if someone else named Haley Page tried to use their name? They never contracted to sell the right to use their name. They're not the, um, I love seeing you guys, you guys bring up your DCI groups in the chat. I fucking love you. God, Lawners, you're so goddamn great. Um, 
they're not the contracting party. If there was another designer named Haley Page who tried to compete with Bridal, here's the thing that would happen. It's a trademark violation. So then it would just go to trademark. You can't use a trademark that also competes with that trademark. So then it just becomes a trademark issue. So it's not that JLM can use their name. It's JLM has Haley Page contracted in Bridal. Can another Haley Page use their name in some other thing? Yes, but not in Bridal because it's trademarked. Could a Haley Page designer, assuming, I'm making assumptions here, assuming Haley Page did not trademark outside the US, could a British designer named Haley Page go design in uh, the UK and not compete with those trademarks? Probably, but it depends. But I don't know if you would want to because there's already brand stuff. If another brand has that name, it can be difficult. I love that I know all of the DCI groups that you guys are talking about. <laughs> Carolina Crown Inferno was my favorite show ever. Husband was a blue devil. Uh, Madison Scouts, go Phantom Regiment, go Blue Coats. You guys are the best. I love seeing all the DCI groups. Memphis Sound alum, Phantom Regiment. God, you guys have made my little nerdy day. Uh, I'll let the chat describe DCI to those of you that are new to DCI. If you see any of these names here, you can also get on to YouTube and go watch the DCI performances. Um, it is com it is competitive band. It is band made competitive. And it just make it makes my heart so happy. Um, in your opinion, how does a lawsuit affect someone, especially if it drags out multiple years? It depends on the someone. Um, there's a lot of drum corps people. A lot of drum corps people in this chat. I, you see how I am. Um, litigation affects everyone differently. Some people love the fight but people can get too wrapped up in the fight and can't let it go. And then they hurt themselves by not being able to let it go. It is financially and emotionally draining. It is not easy. It is not for, it is not for the faint of heart. It is not a fun process. You, everyone, even if you win, everyone is dragged through the mud and it is exhausting. So how does it affect people? It financially and emotionally drains them. Even if they win. Not so much for corporations, but for individuals fighting, yes. I don't, I, you know, if you look at the reporting on the Cardi B lawsuit, um, it goes through how the defamation against her made her feel and how devastating it was to her and how hard all of it was um, and was really well reported on how devastating it was. And you will see others talk about choosing to... Um, to suspend or not follow through on litigation because of the internal toll. And a lot of people make that choice. And I will never, ever give somebody a hard time for saying, I, I can't withstand this. I, I'm going to, moving on is better for me, you know? And there's a lot of people who are like, letting this go is going to be better for me financially and mentally. And a lot of people don't pursue their rights for that. But when you get like, Microsoft versus Activision or whatever. It's a whole different thing because it's just corporations fighting over stuff and the lawyers win at the end of the day. But when it's individuals fighting, it is draining and exhausting. Being involved in litigation is draining and exhausting. I have a dear friend whose husband was very much injured in a vehicle collision. And that fight was excruciating. Clearly, he was in the right. It was years, years long fight dealing with dealing with injury, dealing with medical bills. It's it's part of why, like, knowing what plaintiffs are dealing with when you get to plaintiff's law, like what Murdaugh did, um, and how difficult it is to fight legally while you're also fighting physically and mentally, it's one of the things that just pisses me off so much. So, um, yeah. All right. What else? I love seeing all the, the drum coat, the drum core stuff in the in it um rachel mills had a comment in the chat and this is you know tory lanes was sentenced yesterday to 10 years the prosecutors in that case asked for 13 that's which is pretty close um when the court gives 10 pretty close to what um the prosecution asked for but megan the stallion and criminal did an amazing job keeping strength with tory fans going after her and gave a really powerful statement about how difficult it was being a victim of crime and how hard it was to go through the process and did not go into court to give a victim impact statement because she said she could not be in court with him. And that is not uncommon. Um, I've read victim impact statements. I do not do that well. I cry. I've read, maybe that is doing it well. I can't do that unemotionally, 
Um, but there are victims who are like, I cannot be in court again with this person. Coming in to testify was hard enough. I cannot do it. Uh, it is not an easy thing to go through. And the criminal process is a whole different level of difficult from the civil process. Because when you are a victim in criminal case, you don't have a ton of choice in that. If you are a plaintiff in a case, you at least get to choose to take a deep breath and know what you're choosing. Like Leah Remini is not going to have an easy road with the Scientology case, but she got to take a breath, sit down with her lawyers and choose to battle, you know, choose to pick this up and go. With Megan Thee Stallion, she didn't choose what happened to her. It happened to her. You don't, you know, choose to be a victim of a crime. It happens. And then you're in it. And that is a very difficult thing. Your life is upended very quickly. Um, and that's a very difficult thing. So there's no choice there. It all gets taken away from you. And that is part of what makes the process so hard and part of what makes it a mess because then you can tell the prosecutors you don't want to come to court, but then what? You let it go? It's, 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 it's really, really tough. And I think uh, her statement, and that was reported by Megan Cunif and others, um, I, I think Natalie Lawyerchick covered it too, but that statement, I don't know if uh, Meg Thee Stallion released that statement on socials or if it was just reported in the media, but look at that statement. It really is such a, um, a really, I don't know, a really good illustration because she so easily stated, or it probably wasn't easy for her. She stated in a way that was so easy to understand the process and the toll that it took on her. So if anybody wants to understand what that's like, um, it's there. That was, uh, could not have been an easy case at all. So, uh, what else with all of that? Ugh, I have to go get in my car to pick up my kiddo. Y'all, I appreciate you. Thank you for being law nerds. Thank you for being band nerds. Y'all have made my day. Even those of you that are just like ancillary band nerds, y'all made my day. Y'all made my day. Um, I'd love to hear Natalie's thoughts on Leah's case. I don't know if she's covered it yet. I have not looked. It has been between computer stuff and kids back to school. It has been such a week. I can't wait to feel like together next week. I am not all the way together this week. I feel like ah, I'm taking the day off tomorrow to try to like reground myself. I feel so fucking scattered. I worked the fair this week for band. My kids worked the fair. It's the first week of school. It's ugh, this week, this week. Yeah. All the things I just did all the things this week and now I am exhausted. Um <clears throat> and fucking Pokemon sleep gave me a D for the week. They give you a letter grade for the week on your sleep. Last week I got a D and I've slept less this week. Pokemon Go is literally gonna come out here with like you fail at sleeping. Like that's how my week has been. I have failed at sleeping. That is my week. <laughs> I appreciate all of you. This was a lot of fun. We will do another catch-up stream. Um, for those of you that are members, me reading the sidebars in depth heard, well, part of them are available now. <clears throat> hey, Chris, I, I was at UMass in 1996. I went to football games. My son also really likes the Boston Crusaders. I keep telling him if he's trying out for DCI at, at 16, he needs to try out regionally before I can let him like go away. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, question. Can you please tweet at team YouTube and ask them to remonetize Lawner clips channel? Lawner clips got demonetized for reuse content. Um, I need to look at what happened. So let me look at what happened, but the, if it clip, this happens to clips channels, but let me go look at what happened. Um, and see, but YouTube's YouTube's policy on clips channels is pretty, pretty ironclad, but I will go look and see. I know nothing about that, but Carmen, I'll go explore and see what I can see what I can find. All right. With all of that, I appreciate you. I will see you soon. Have a great weekend. I am taking the weekend off. I hope you are too. And, um, the rest is needed. My husband just said, if you saw blue devils around 92, you would have seen him play. Cheers. He loves that you're a DCI fam. Yes. Um, and because I wasn't banned in high school and then my water polo coach made me quit banned. I still don't know if that was the right choice, but life is here and it's a little late to go back and redo. But a lot of my friends went on to DCI. So I did in the nineties, go to a lot of DCI competitions. 
uh, to watch friends perform in DC. I had friends who went on into band in college and all the rest of it. I have such a heart for band. I love it. And I love that my kid loves it because you can't really control what your kids do. I just love that my kid loves it. I'm ready. I'm ready for marching season. Our show's so good this year. My kid has a a solo uh, six on the rifle. He's a rifle kid. And um, I'm so excited. And it like, when he catches it, ba- the band kids will get me and then I'll stop. When he catches his solo, it is right as the music stops. And so it's like the music stops and then it's like, and then it resumes. So that thwack is so perfectly timed. I love the choreography so much. I'm so excited. Okay, all of you, thank you. I appreciate you. I will see you soon. Lawners, oh, go and members, go watch the members only. We're going to need to do another one. We have more sidebars to cover. We might need to do a whiskey stream to cover the sidebars for fun. Channel, if we do that, I might do an open stream for everybody that you need to catch live and then put it on members only for the replay because I, I kind of don't want to keep all the law nerds out of it when we cover the sidebars for Spiegel. So that's what I'm considering. So I will, we'll see. That's what I'm considering. And then we will um, put the replay on members only so we can all do it. All right. Sorry. That was the most Southern goodbye ever. I've just, I've, you know, that, that extended goodbye, a Midwest, goodbye, whatever you're going to call it. All the people who say goodbye for a hundred years. That was me today. Bye. You can find all the Law Nerd goodies at lawnerdshop.com. Connect with me on social media at the Emily D Baker. And don't forget to check out my podcasts, The Emily Show and the new podcast, Quick Bits, summarizing everything I talk about on my Tuesday and Thursday live streams. You know, when you only have time for just the Quick Bits. <laughs>